It is time for today's pre-show of our SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. We are busy getting ready. We're starting the study group in 10 minutes at the top of the hour. And in the meantime, I am making sure that all of this continues to work, that all of this is ready to go. It's not as easy as you might think. Uh, so we'll check things. Uh, cameras are good. Streaming is working. Hello, chat room. I can see folks are filing in. Thanks for being here. We've got uh, recordings going down here. You can see my Cylons going here, the bottom right. That's good. We got, um, I think we're in pretty good shape. We just have to get the VVox running. I guess I could put up, let's, there we go. It was a lower third. You can always use that. All right. Is it still okay to take the 601 instead of the 701? Yes, the 601 will continue to be available through July 31st. So you've got a good six months plus that you could study and take. If you started today, you could study the 601 and pass it. I don't know that that is the best thing to do if you're starting today. But if you've been studying for the 601, keep studying because that's that exam will still be around. So yes, keep Keep doing that. Keep going through those uh, those 601 materials. If you're just getting started, then you have the choice. You could either take the 601 exam or the 701 exam. So we'll see. And there are 701 study groups planned. This will probably be our last 601 study group because it's now been out for a couple of months, a month and a half, <laughs> something like that. And uh, people, are, people are tending to pick it up pretty quickly. So we'll have to find out. Um, how that goes. So I have all new questions and things to write for January. But I, yeah, I think in January, we're going to start with the 701 version of the study group. And you got the 601. You have three hours plus, three years plus of the 601 study groups you can always go back and look at. So that's the important part. A lot of folks in the chat room checking in. Some folks who have passed their exams. Justin says pass May plus and security plus this year. Congratulations on that. I've got... Um, RC says past 601 last week. Got to love that. All of these are good stories. Always like hearing them. Malk is in the chat room. Thanks for checking in, Malk. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Hopefully warmer where you are than where I am. What is the temperature here? 52 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds horrible. <laughs> it sounds not fun. I know it's colder other places, but it's also warmer other places. We got to work on that. We got to work on getting the temperature up. And see how things go. Thanks for everyone for checking in. Thanks for being here. Our last live stream of the year. It's a banner day. So we've got we've got all of this content that we've been creating and creating and creating. So it's now uh it's now the end of the year has finally hit. And now we get to kind of reflect on how things are. Gotta gotta figure all of that out. See, other folks are saying, oh, it's 39 here. It's 33 here. Uh, yeah, I'm never going to live those in those places. It's 37. <laughs> no, thank you. 41 in Rhode Island. Nope. Not going to do that. Although 52, I guess this morning it was in the 40s when I got up. It was 38 in the morning, uh, 38 degrees when I got up yesterday morning. So, yeah, it's, it gets cold here, but um, it doesn't stay that way. Although 52, I'm saying, is it's freezing. How do people live like this? And here I am. But we'll figure it out. Ah, oh, the uh, the problem is that it doesn't get much warmer today. It's just cold. I'm not a not a big winter fan. Have you noticed? <laughs> Could you tell? Don't really like the cold. Uh, I really prefer the warmth. I really like the heat. Get all of that all that going here. And it's gonna be it's gonna be warmer in this room because the lights are on and I'm talking and there's equipment running and it gets a little warmer here as the study group goes on. I might have to turn the air conditioner on once we get things going because it's going to get warm. So there's the irony of my life. It's freezing outside and I'm turning the air conditioner on. But that's that's what you have to do when you're shooting these videos and getting the live stream going. So definitely that way. Okay, first time in the group, Gary says, past Network Plus in May, now studying for the 701. Looking forward to beginning next year. And some of the material we will go through today would apply to 701. 
but um, definitely it's it's uh, it's not the case. If you're, if you're ever in a situation where you're trying to figure all of this out, uh, it is definitely not the case that uh, that the that the six hundred one six hundred one seven hundred one. You can you really see there's a a bit of both in this study group. I think this obviously all the questions are written for the six hundred one, but the seven hundred one. Uh, let's see. If we look at the 601 exam objectives, 65% of the objectives were thrown out to make the 701. That's how different these exams are. Um, there are some, some people on the Internet will tell you, no, nah, not much has changed. It's about the same. <laughs> not even close. 64, actually, technically, 64% of the exam objectives in the 601 do not appear in the 701. Completely gone, deleted, thrown out. You'll never need to know those for the 701. So the 701, half of that material is brand new. It's not more than half or less than half because the, the exam is smaller uh, by number of objectives. So that's the real challenge. So if people are new to cybersecurity. What would you believe would be easier to learn 601 and 701? It's not really an easy thing. I would say the, the difficulty level of both exams is very similar, but the amount of of exam objectives on the 601 is a bit larger. So there's more things you have to memorize. So if you were just getting started today, let me put it this way. If I was just getting started today uh, and I had to decide, do I take the 601 or 701? I'd probably take the 701. It's been out for a little bit. I'm not, uh, I don't have to worry about a retirement date because what if I start studying and something in my world requires me to slow down the studying? So that that type of thing. Uh, so that's that's what I would probably choose. I'd probably choose the 701. Because now there's books out, there's videos out. Um, my course notes are out. My practice exams will be out shortly. So we've got 701 materials. So it's really more about getting finding the one that's right for you. Now, if you've been studying the 601, just keep doing that. Would I ever consider working for CompTIA? No, I don't, I'm not, I would never consider working for anyone again. Because I've got my own thing going. So I would not really consider working for CompTIA. I mean, if I wasn't doing this, that's certainly an option. <laughs> let, me, let me restate this. It's not that I wouldn't work for them. They're a fine organization. It's just I've got my own thing here. So I don't, I don't have any plans to work for CompTIA or anyone else, for that matter. I work for me, which is kind of nice. So that that's uh so we're working through this. We got a study group today. We are working on 601 today. Uh so there's a lot. Are there security jobs with AI now? <laughs> thankfully, thankfully no. Somebody described AI very well in an article I was looking at that it's a a, a very um how did they put it? I forget the terminology they used, but it's a um uh a, a, a toddler who will do anything you tell it to do. And it has the ability of a toddler. It has the thinking aspect of a toddler. That's AI. So no, there's no AI in security, thankfully. Now, there are, there are things you can go through and look through data to find things that I really wouldn't call that AI because it isn't. It's more of an intelligent search filtering mechanism. Um, but there are things we can do with what people think of AI, what they call AI, what they think must be AI because it's so magical, um, that, that we can apply towards some things that we are doing in security. But you know, as we've seen with AI, it's, it's not that great. It's not so good. They got to they gotta work on that a little bit longer. Um, it is certainly A, it is definitely not I. There's our problem. So I'm, I'm all in on the A, but so far there's not a, little, not a lot of I. Got to work on that one. Would you still be eligible for the same number of jobs if you complete the 601 over the 701? It doesn't matter because if you pass the 601, you are in the Security Plus. If you pass the 701, you are in the Security Plus. So what you earn at the end of that is identical. There's no difference. And employers really don't care what exam you took to earn your certification. They only care, did you complete it? Which is a good thing to worry about. Stop of the hour. Let me see if I can get my act together here. We are going to bring up our presentation, our questions, and everything else. And I think it's time for a live stream. Top of the hour. 
we can get this started right now. Why don't we? Uh, let's see if I can get my act together. Uh, let's see. Let's get the keynote going. We'll get a green light. There's our green light. Love it. And a lot of people have questions about the 601 or 701. I would recommend that you post your question in VVox now, and I will see your questions in the live stream, the second hour of the live stream in the after show. And we'll do that. So I think that's a good thing for everyone. All right, presentation's ready to go. Let's do a live stream, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2023 SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. This is our live study group that we do every month where I take questions. I create questions that come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives for Security Plus. And then I ask those questions of you to see how much you know about those objectives. It's always fun. And if you're here live, thank you for being here. We have a great group that's in the chat room. And I'll also remind you that we have our Q&A in the second hour where you can ask me any question you would like. Uh, you can submit those questions at any time. And we'll talk about how to do that right now. Because one of the nice things about working through these different uh, technologies is we have a way to be able to do this online. So one of the things that you can do is pop open a new browser window and head over to professormesser.com slash QA. That is where you can go to answer these questions. Uh, one of the things that we do with these questions is I like to be able to um, to see how well you remember things. So we need to check and see how much you know about the topics that we cover. And maybe let's look at a question that we had last month to see if you're able to get into what we call our VVox app and be able to use these. This one asks, a security administrator needs to search a storage drive to obtain email messages and browser histories. Which of the following would provide this functionality? And there are a number of options. As always, our rule in the chat room is please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. Instead, you want to follow the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, to answer that. So a security administrator needs to search a storage drive to obtain email messages and browser histories. Which of the following would provide this functionality? Is it the harvester, autopsy, Nessus, DNS enum, or memdump? And if you think you know the answer, follow the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA to lock in your answer. We'll see how well you did on this in just a moment. We will come back to that question. And you can see, of course, the vvox.app is there. And you can use the ID of 105-586-674. Or much easier, just go to professormesser.com slash QA. I think that's the easy part. Well, thank you for being here on our live stream. We do one of these live streams every month, as I mentioned. And when we're not here doing a live stream, then, of course, we have many things that you are able to visit. Of course, we have our YouTube channel where all of our SY0601 and all of our SY0701 Security Plus videos are posted. You can watch any of them at any time. You don't have to register. You don't have to do anything special. They're just out on the Internet for everyone in the world to be able to watch. You can find those at professormesser.com slash YouTube. We also have a weekly Security Plus pop quiz question. You can find that at professormesser.com slash Twitter, which I'm still calling it for some reason. And then professormesser.com slash Instagram, which has the same question, but with a pretty picture because you need one of those if it's on Instagram. And there's many other places you can find us online. Usually you type in professormesser.com slash in the name of the site that you would like to be able to use for that. Now, I'll also let you know that there are two different Security Plus exams that you could take right now. You only need to take one of these. The first one we'll look at is the one that was released in November the 12th of 2020, and that is the SY0601. That's the version of the exam for Security Plus. This exam will continue to be around until July of 2024. So on July 31st, that exam is no longer available. That means if you are studying for your 601 right now, keep studying. 
keep working on those 601 materials, keep using your 601 book, keep watching the 601 videos, keep working with the 601 practice exams, go through everything that you need to learn on the 601 and take that exam and pass it before the retirement date of July 31st, 2024. That's your big deadline right now, but you're talking six, seven months away. So you still got a bit of a of a ramp. You've got a bit of time before you have to worry about that, but it is a concern and make sure you put that into your calendar. So you recognize that that's coming up. Don't wait until the last day to take your exam, because if something happens and you don't pass that exam, you're going to have to start all over with the 701 materials, maybe not all over, but a huge amount of information will need to be learned from the 701. The security plus exam is a single exam. You get 90 minutes to take this exam. You could get a maximum of 90 questions. So you've got maybe fewer than 90 that you might get on your exam, but they could give you a maximum of 90. The score that you need to earn is on a scale between 100 and 900, and the score that you need to earn is a 750 on that scale. So that is an important number. It's exactly the same regardless which Security Plus exam that you're going to take. Uh, the exam itself is mostly multiple-choice-based questions, but there are some other types of questions on the exam, performance-based questions. We'll talk more about those in just a moment. There is a newer version that has been released of the Security Plus exam. So for the time being, at least until July the 31st, you could take the 601 version or you could take the 701 version. You only need to take one. You don't take both of them. Uh, the SY0701 is the newest version of the Security Plus exam. It's only been out about a month and a half. So it's only been out since November the 7th of this year, 2023, which means that it's probably going to retire somewhere around May of 2027. We'll know more about specific dates once we get closer to 2027, but we don't have to worry about that right now. It's so far away. All we have to worry about right now is whether you're planning to take the 601 or the 701. There's a lot of questions about that. And if you'd like to submit into VBOX right now the question you have about the 601 or 701, we'll be glad to answer that in the second hour. Uh, again, this is exactly the same format as the 601. A uh, single exam, 90 minutes, maximum of 90 questions. You need to score 750 on a scale from 100 to 900. So it's exactly the same format with exactly the same number of questions and really even the exact type of layout of questions, which are both multiple choice and performance-based questions. And as I mentioned, we will talk about performance-based questions in just a moment. So the, the real question that comes up, and we've already talked a little bit about this today, is which one of these do I take? Well, the 601 and the 701, those two exams, get you to the exact same result, which is your Security Plus certification. Security Plus certifications aren't numbered or labeled. So if you pass the 601, you've earned the Security Plus. If you pass the 701, you've earned the Security Plus. Someone who took their exam 10 years ago and has continued to update and renew their certification every three years has also earned the Security Plus. And they took the 401 version 10 years ago, for example. So really don't worry so much about what version of the exam you are taking. You should pick an ex a version and go with that because all of your study materials should match that version. But the ultimate final certification you earn doesn't have a, a label or a hook on it or some type of tag that says, oh, he took the 601 version. Hmm. Or he took the 701 version. Hmm. No, nobody cares. All they care about is, did you pass the exam? Oh, you did? You're Security Plus certified. Congratulations. That's what you need to worry about. Now, the version you take might matter when it comes to renewal, but it has no, did nobody who really is hiring or looking at your certifications care which version of the exam you really took. Uh, as I often say, there are limited study materials available when an exam is first released, and the 701 exam has only been out about a month and a half. But in that month and a half, CompTIA has all of their study materials available. I have almost all of my study materials available. Every video is available on YouTube. There's a lot of materials right there. So that is uh, one of the things that is really important is that you have the right resources and that they match the version of the exam that you plan to take. That is an important consideration. So if you're taking the 601, all of your study materials should say 601. If you're taking the 701, all of your study materials should say 701. Never study for an exam using a different set of exam materials. So don't 
study for the 601 using 701 materials. Don't study for the 701 using 601 materials. Seems obvious, but there are quite a number of differences between these. And some people may think, well, it's Security Plus. How different can it be? Well, as it turns out, it's very, very, very different. So don't, don't uh, be in a situation where you're using the wrong study materials because you'll walk into that exam and you will not have a good time. Out on our website, we have downloadable versions of all of our courses available. You can purchase those either from the 601 pull-down menu or the 701 pull-down menu. We have success bundles for both. And you can find that our course notes for 601, our practice exams for 601, our exam hacks ebook, and everything that you need to be able to pass the 601 exam are on our website. You can find out more about that at professormesser.com slash 601SB. I'll also let you know that this will be available, this, this live stream content will be available for replay immediately afterwards on YouTube. Something that's done automatically when I hit the stop button, it takes a minute or two to refresh, and then that replay is immediately posted. If you'd like an audio-only version, I publish that in a podcast format, which makes it very easy to add to your podcast listening program. You can find the RSS and other links for that at professormesser.com slash podcast. And there are links there for my A+, my Network+, Plus, and my Security+, Plus live streams. There, if you have a streaming service that you like to use, like uh, you, you're a Spotify listener, you don't even have to download anything. Simply search for Professor Messer on Spotify or your favorite streaming service, and you should find us there as well. If we're not on your favorite streaming service, please let me know, and I will be glad to add it to that service. Also let you know the videos for this I mentioned are available immediately afterwards. And if you wait about a day or so, you'll notice that the YouTube video description will be updated with a series of timestamps. Those are not created by magic. They're certainly not created by AI because you'll notice they're absolutely correct. And they're correct because a human did them. My marketing manager, Lori, who's watching the replay. Hi, Lori. She is, uh, she's colder than I am. She's up north right now visiting family. So she is working through all of these videos. She's going through and putting timestamps in the YouTube video description so that you can find the information you need very, very, very quickly. Uh, it's a very easy way. You can go back years and find the, the information that you need. It might help you as we hop around these live streams. Also let you know that when we're not here doing a live stream, you can always find me on our Discord. I'm there along with a lot of other folks who are studying for their A+, their Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus, or even other certifications. It's all on the Professor Messer Discord. We'd love for you to join us there. It's a fantastic community, and you can join us by visiting professormesser.com slash discord or use the links in the upper right on my website for the social media. So there are a lot of things that we do there, and we are usually in Discord a lot more than we're doing a live stream. So it's a great way to meet people, study with other folks, and maybe learn some from the other people that are in the community. That's at professormesser.com slash discord. At some point, you will need to take the exam, and we could do that. Uh, by going to the CompTIA website and paying full price for your voucher. But why would you do that? Why would you pay full price if you're in the U.S. or Canada or U.S. territory? I have discounted vouchers on my website. And what's better than a discounted voucher? Not only do you get the voucher for less, you don't need a special code, you don't need a coupon, you don't need anything special. All you need is to visit professormesser.com slash vouchers. Not only do you get a voucher, but I even give you a little more. If you buy the voucher on my site, you get a copy of my exam hacks ebook. This is an ebook I wrote where I took all of the tips and tricks that I've accumulated through the years of taking 20 to 25 different industry certification exams. And I have put all of those tips into one single document. These are things that can help you with the study process. There are even tips in there that can help you during the exam itself. That's right. You might even be able to get a couple of extra points by following the tips that I have in my Exam Hacks ebook. That's yours absolutely free if you purchase the voucher on my site by visiting professormesser.com slash vouchers. Let's go back to that question I asked earlier, which was, a security administrator needs to search a storage drive to obtain email messages and browser histories. Which of the following would provide this functionality? Is it the Harvester, Autopsy, Nessus, DNS Enum, or MemDump? 
Let's happen to see what you wrote on this one. Number of you have put in your answers, 57% of you, which, by the way, is much better than we did last month, say the answer is autopsy, and that is the correct answer. Autopsy is what we were looking for. It's a great little program. It's a great big program in actuality that will go through a physical drive or a drive image and search through the drive contents to find all kinds of information. You want to find somebody's browser history? It's stored on there somewhere. You want to look through their emails? It's in there. You want to pull up every graphics file that you can find on the entire drive? Autopsy will do that for you. Pull up databases and other information as well. Autopsy is a great utility to be able to do this. If you ever want to have some fun, get a used drive from eBay, put it into Autopsy. You'll be surprised what you happen to come up when, when you do that. I need to make a video of when I did that with the drive I got from the folks over at eBay. I just bought them randomly from somebody who was selling them on eBay. It's remarkable what you're able to do with this. So Autopsy is the correct answer. That's what we were looking for. The Harvester is a, a an OSINT uh, open source intelligence utility. can hunt through Facebook, for example, to find information about someone or LinkedIn. Uh, we've also got Nessus, which is a great a, a tool to use for vulnerability scanning. Uh, DNS Enum allows you to enumerate DNS information. That's where that name comes from. And then MemDump, as the name implies, takes anything that's in your random access memory, your RAM of your system, and it outputs that all of that information into a file that you can use for later. So you've got a lot of different capabilities here. But for being able to search a storage drive to obtain email messages and browser histories, the only thing on this list that would do it would indeed be autopsy. And 57% of you got that one absolutely correct. So you've got a number of you have got that one exactly as it should be. Well done with that. Well, as I mentioned earlier, when you sit down to take your Security Plus exam, the questions that you get right at the beginning of the exam are not multiple choice. You will get a handful of questions at the beginning of your exam that are performance-based questions. Performance-based questions are questions that are anything but multiple choice. They might be a matching question, a fill in the blank, a drag and drop. They might put you at a command prompt and ask you to perform a function. I guess if it's the 601. If it's the 701, it won't because there are no command lines on the 701. Um, but for the 601 and 701, the performance-based questions are simply anything that is not multiple choice. So I have for you, as I do with all of our live streams, our first new question of the month is always a performance-based question. Let's see how well you do with the performance-based question today. The one I have for you now is this performance-based question right here that asks, Something you know, something you have, or something you are. Some of these answers have more than one response. So uh, I have, and I'm going to put this up so you can actually answer this online. There we go. I want to know something you know, something you have, or something you are. And for each of, I have four different scenarios, and I want you to tell me what those are. And uh, and as I mentioned in here, some of these might have more than one response. Response is written right there behind my head there. You can't see it. There it is. So the four different uh, scenarios that we have here, the first one is using an automated teller machine requires a card and a pen. We know that. Uh, if you've ever used an, an automated teller machine before, uh, so for that, is that something you know, something you have, or something you are, or some combination of multiples of those? See if you can put that in. Next on our list is an airport check-in process requires photo identification. What is that? Is that something you know, something you have, or something you are? Think carefully on that one. The door to a data center requires an ID card and a handprint. Is that something you know, something you have, or something you are? And then lastly... We have the main door to a building uses two separate keys on a key ring. So we have to know if that's something you know, something you have, or something you are. Now, as always, of course, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We're going to go through each of these and see how well you happen to know them. You can lock in your answer by visiting professormesser.com slash QA 
and locking your answer in in our V box. See if you happen to know what these are. I'm going to watch these. Should I watch the answers as they're coming through? And then I'll let you guys answer these. And, and since it's something you have, something you know, something you have, something you are, you can even answer them no, have, or are. I'm not compiling the answers on this one because it's a fill in the blank. So I will simply be looking through them and being able to find what we want to, to see as we're, we're sifting through those. How well do we know? The one I want you to really look at, the one I'm really focused, well, I'm not going to tell you yet. We're going to wait till you answer them, and then I'll tell you which one I'm looking at, which one I'm interested in seeing. We'll have to see if uh, if this is something you're familiar with. Uh, and I'll also remind you, by the way, this is a good time. If you have questions for the after show, you can submit those right now in VBOX. Simply visit ProfessorMesser.com slash QA. There's a tab on the top where you can flip over to the Q&A board and submit your question. The question won't appear except on your side for your question. Uh, nobody else sees these questions until... I put them out here, so be a good way to do it. So we'll have to see how well you like this particular question. This is effectively a fill in the blank. So for the first, for the four answers that we have here, you can tell me what they happen to be. Separate them out into those four. So those of you listening on the podcast side, again, something you know, something you have, or something you are. Some answers will have more than one response. So is using an automated teller machine requires a card and a pen. What is that? What what of those three or what combination of those three would that be? An airport check-in process requires photo identification. Is that something you know, something you have, or something you are? The door to a data center requires an ID card and a handprint. Something you know, something you have, something you are. And then the main door to a building uses two separate keys on a key ring. Is that something you know, something you have, or something you are? See if you know what that one happens to be. We'll have to see if this is something you're familiar with. Obviously, these a multi-factor authentication is an important part of the Security Plus. And whether you're taking the 601 or 701, you need to know this. So for those of you that are on the live stream and you know that oh, it's the 601 study group, but you're planning to take the 701, this question is absolutely for you as well. So uh, we'll all, we're sort of easing into the 701 content, aren't we? There is a, a lot, little bit of overlap between the 601 and 701, not a ton of overlap. There's much more different on these two exams than there is similar, but there are a number of, of topics that are certainly the same between both of them. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, something you know, something you have, or something you are, and these answers could have more than one response. Let's start with the very first one, which says using an automated teller machine requires a card and a pin, not a not a writing pin, although I guess it could, depending on what you're doing. But in this case, it's a P-I-N, all capital letters. A, 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 this is something that uh, we're commonly doing. We put our card into the ATM, and it asks us for a personal identification number. That's what the pin is. So the personal identification number and the card, the card is something that we have with us. We can't use the ATM unless we have that card at least in this particular scenario. There are ATMs out there where you don't have to have a card with you. You don't have to have your checkbook with you. You don't have to have anything with you except perhaps identification. And they can they can have a teller come up on the screen and talk to you, a video chat, where they will look at your ID information and then grant you access to your account. In this case, we need a card and a pen, which is an ATM card and a pen. The ATM card is something you have. The personal identification number is something that's in your brain. Only you know that number so that is something you know. So in this case, there are two answers. Something you know and something you have would be what we use as multi-factor authentication every time we use an ATM. Next on our list, and the one I told you, think about this one carefully, an airport check-in process requires photo identification. Is that something you know, something you have, or something you are? The answer, the answer may surprise you. The answer in this case is something you are is the answer. It's an important distinction, by the way. Obviously, with an ATM, you're using a card. When you check in at the airport, you're also using a card. It's a different card, obviously. You're not using your ATM card to check in at the airport. You're using some type of photo identification. The photo identification, you do obviously have it, but that photo identification has to be your photo identification. They're not checking to see, do you have the card with you? They're checking to see, what your name is on that card, what the picture looks like. Is that picture you? 
Uh, tell me what address you're at. They confirm some information sometimes. So you not only have to have the card, you have to have the right card with you because the information on the card is what they are checking. They're not just checking, do you have a card with you? Oh, do you have ID? Oh, good. No, I don't have to see it. Just to know that you have it is enough. No, they don't do that. They look, they give me that card. They're going to look at it. They're going to check it. Is it all right? And then it is something you are is what they are looking for. They want to confirm the information on the card matches the person that's standing in front of them. Therefore, it's something you are. It is not something you have. Uh, that is not the case. Just having it is not an authentication factor. They don't care about that part. They don't care that you showed up with a card. It means nothing. If you have an ID with you at the airport, is irrelevant. What's important is that the information on that ID matches the person that's standing in front of them. And that's why the, just having the card and it being something you have is not a factor of authentication in that particular case. That's an important consideration. Next on our list, door to a data center requires an ID card and a handprint. Well, the ID card is something that we have. Generally, we're sliding that card in so that we can confirm we have this card with us. Again, we got to, whether it's our card, card or not, we're using that as an authentication factor. The real part that matches the card to the person is the handprint. And that's why if you're in a, a more secure data center environment, you're using more than just someone's card to get in. If that was the case, you could grab it off someone's desk and take it in. We don't want to do that. We want to use our card to get in. But to confirm that it's our ID, we have to use a handprint. It checks both of those. If those match, now you're allowed access into the data center. The ID card is something you have. Your handprint is something you are. And then lastly, the main door to a building uses two separate keys on a key ring. So we have to use one key, unlock, and then in this big key ring, find the other key and unlock the other one. Why do they have doors like this? But they do. Uh, those two keys are not two types of authentication. It's not two different types of, of factors. It's not multi-factor. It's a single factor. It's the same factor twice. So that's when you get into this situation where something you have would be the keys on the key ring. We just happen to have two of those. We have two of something you are. So it's something you have, rather. Something you have x2 times 2. So the something you have would be your keys on the key ring. And that is a very good one to be able to know this. Folks in the chat room thinking, this is a little bit unusual. Where did this come from? It came from Section 2.4 of the 601 exam for multi-factor authentication. There is a multi-factor authentication section on the 701 as well. This applies to both of those. So this is important. For the airport, again, uh, folks are really concerned about the airport question. Just having the ID is not an authentication factor. You showing up with the ID doesn't matter. What matters is what's on the ID. So having it is, is not as important as what is on the card itself. So in that particular case, we're not authenticating the fact that you have a card with you. No one cares that you brought the card with you. The important part is what's on the card. And that's the authentication factor part. Uh, just showing up the airport with an ID of some kind doesn't authenticate you to go anywhere. So that's the, the important part. And in fact, if you've been in many airports, you've noticed that you don't even have to have ID in some cases anymore. So it may be the case where it's not even necessary to fly. Well, that wasn't the question here. But in this case, photo identification is there to actually check what's on the photo identification. So there you go. That's That, I think, is a good mix of these. Something you know, something you have, or something you are. Make sure you're familiar with all of these authentication factors. And there are other authentication factors on the 701 that you need to know about. So that's what's important, too. To, to make this different, I, I travel with Mrs. Professor Messer all the time. We're in the airport. And if I handed them her ID, they would not let me through the, the security. So just having a card with you doesn't help because I usually have her ID with me. And we I usually have both of these and print into both together. But what if I just handed them my flight information and her identification? Hey, it's something I have. Doesn't that count for anything? No, it doesn't. <laughs> does not. So maybe that helps you figure out the differences there. And not that I've done that before. I've absolutely done that before. So that is our performance-based question of the month. Hopefully that's given you something to think about, some ideas on these. And as uh, you step through and work through the first few questions of your exam, you might get 
a number of different performance-based questions. Usually there's about a handful. You have to work through all of those. Let's now shift gears back to a multiple choice based question and see how well we do with this. This next question asks, a user's browser will only send session keys over an encrypted connection. Which of the following would best describe this functionality? Is that code signing, input validation, static code analysis, secure cookies, or fuzzing? A user's browser will only send session keys over an encrypted connection. Which of the following would best describe this functionality? Is that code signing, input validation, static code analysis, secure cookies, or fuzzing? Do you think you know the answer? Please visit the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. See how well you do. Some folks in the chat room are, are, are speculating on how valuable performance-based questions are on the exam, and uh, we don't know. CompTIA does not share anything about the exam grading process, but there have been people that have passed their Security Plus exam and not taken any of the performance-based questions. Now, I don't recommend that. In their particular case, they ran out of time. They skipped over them at the beginning. They went through all of the multiple choice. And by the time they circled back to the very beginning to tackle the performance-based questions, time was up. They literally did not answer anything on the performance-based questions, and they still passed their exam. So it is possible. I think a lot of people over... Uh, overthink the performance-based questions and, in some cases, make them out to be more worth more than they might actually be. I think people worry about the, it's the fear of the unknown. They worry about these because they've not seen them before. So that's where I mentioned to people, make sure you're very familiar with the performance-based question process. Be always careful about the timing. Uh, time management on your exams is very important. So make sure you are familiar with all of those. I think it's an important consideration um, when you are planning to take these exams that you, are, you know what to expect when you sit down for that. So we'll figure out what all these happen to be. Your answers need to go in here. Users browse. Well, let's see how we're doing on. Yep, the number of you have answered this one. So let's see how you did with this particular question. This question asks, a user's browser will only send session keys over an encrypted connection. Which of the following would best describe this functionality? Is that code signing, input validation, static code analysis, secure cookies, or fuzzing? Let's see how you did on this one. A number of you have answered, and 68% of you say that's secure cookies. We have 12% that say it's code signing. We've got 11% that say input validation. It is uh, that's a pretty good number. And then after those, we go to single digits. 4% say fuzzing, and 3% say static code analysis. So you've got a number of different options here, but almost a, a large number of you anyway have said, well, 68% of you have said, secure cookies is what you would use. Sending session keys across the network is something that you have to be very careful about because session keys themselves contain quite a bit of important information. The session keys have in them the information that someone could use to gain access to an authenticated session on a web-based service. So if you are someone who is working through, uh, you're, you're logged into Facebook, you're logged into X, you're logged into the Professor Messer website, there is a session key associated with that transaction, with that communication. And if somebody else gets their hands on that session key, they can effectively gain access to your account without needing your username and password. So when we transfer the session key information, it needs to be over an encrypted method so that nobody's able to gather that information. So what we would use for that is we would store it very commonly in cookies that are in your browser. These session keys are usually only valid for a certain amount of time. So the session key might be valid for an hour or for 12 hours or for 24 hours, and then the session key is no longer valid, and you would have to re-authenticate after that time frame is over. But in the meantime, it'll store the session key in your browser, and you can go back to that site and access that site without having to put your username and password every time you access the site. But to be able to 
to protect that information, we need to be able to store it in an encrypted form or store it or transfer it in an encrypted form and store it in a process in the cookie where we're marking this as a secure cookie. That secure cookie means that we've got an attribute set in the cookie itself saying this information is very important that stays private, that it stays secure. And if you ever transfer this information out of this computer, it has to be to a site that is HTTPS. The S stands for savings, of course. The S is secure. That's our HTTP protocol secure so that if someone tried to spoof that website or access that website in a form where you were simply using HTTP and sending everything in the clear, that cookie would not be transferred from your browser. The browser would say, wait, I can't let that information out. You're over a non-encrypted link. This cookie is configured to be a secure cookie, is marked with the security option, and I'm not going to transfer it unless this is a secure and encrypted connection between you and the website. So that's why we do that. Now, generally, we don't store a lot of sensitive information in our cookie. Session ID is probably the most sensitive type of thing we put there. So it, most people will not see any type of secure information other than perhaps session IDs in that cookie. It's not going to store your credit card information. It's not going to store your, your personal address information. Your, your phone number is not in there. The secure cookie is really designed to be a temporary storage area to facilitate communication between your device and that website. So session IDs is a perfect thing to put as a secure cookie. And that is the answer here. We were looking for secure cookies. 68% of you got that one right. We also have code signing. Code signing, you may have seen before. If you've ever installed an application or device driver, one of the things you may have noticed is during that process, it might tell you this particular signature for this application has been validated and or this the signature for this device driver has been validated perhaps more importantly if the signature is not validated when you're installing it it stops the installation process and says i can't install this because the signature does not validate somebody has changed something within this application or within this software that leads us to believe that perhaps Something funny is going on, so therefore we're not going to install it. It failed the signature. Code signing is great when you're installing that software, but it's not used when you have a browser that will only send session keys via an encrypted connection. So code signing would not be the right answer. Input validation is commonly used by applications to make sure that the information you're putting into the application is valid. So for example, you're putting in a credit card number. There is a type of validation that is made for credit card numbers. So if you just put in a bunch of random numbers, if the credit card is, is what is it, 11, 12, 15 numbers, you put in all those 16 values for the credit card number. And if you just use random numbers, you may notice that it doesn't validate properly. So the, the validation is an important part of that. And of course, your application needs to validate credit card numbers, your address information, names, email addresses. All of those are important. You ever try to register for a site and you put in your email address and you forget the at symbol or you you put in uh, the, the, the domain name you put in is a dot C-O-N instead of C-O-M. Um, and a good validation will see that and go, wait, you didn't put an at sign and this is an email address. Oh, wait, you put C-O-N. That's not a valid top layer domain. You need to put in an appropriate top layer domain. That's a great input validation right there. Hopefully your application is written well enough to be able to do that. We also have static code analysis. 3% chose that one. This is an application that goes through your code, if you're an application developer, and looks through the code to see if it can identify any security concerns within the way that you wrote the software. Very complex to be able to do that, but an important step. If you're not an application developer, you've probably never done that, but hopefully the folks writing your apps are doing that as well. And then fuzzing is the process of just randomly putting information into the input fields of an application. It's a good way to test if your input validation is working because if you're able to sneak some information in that causes some inconsistencies or weirdness with the application, then your input validation is not working right. Fuzzing can sometimes find a way to gain access or modify the availability of an application 
So you may want to run a fuzzing test before deploying any type of application. In this case, if you want to send session keys over an encrypted connection, you would be using secure, secure cookies. And 68% of you got that one absolutely right. Well done with that one. Let's do another question, shall we? I've got another one on this list. Our next question asks, a security administrator is gathering data from a compromised host. Which of the following should be gathered first? Would it be any previous backups, a drive image, default router configuration, TMP directory contents, or a memory dump? A security administrator is gathering data from a compromised host. Which of the following should be gathered first? Is it any previous backups, drive image, default router configuration, TMP directory contents, or a memory dump? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. Be able to tell what this one happens to be. Lock in your answer. People are putting their answers in really quick on this one which is we either know it really well or we think we know it really well. Sometimes it's one or the other as we step through this. This may be one that you know of as you're working through these. This is a lot of these are questions. Obviously, knowing what to do first, knowing what to do second, knowing what to do third, these are important things to do. These are important things to know. So uh, certainly from a security perspective, we better know this because we got to gather data. And gathering data is an important part of recovering from these. So make sure you're familiar with it. This is anytime you have a security incident, you have to really know what to do next. Because if you do the wrong thing, you could lose data. If you do the wrong thing, you could miss out on gathering evidence. So that's important. And in this case, it doesn't matter what type of machine it is. You just tell me. Let's, let's assume it could be anything. But we could assume that they have backups and a drive image and a default router configuration and a slash TMP directory and a memory dump. All of these things exist. So it really doesn't matter which what type of operating system it is. It could be any operating system. It doesn't matter. See how you do with this one. A lot of you already locked in your answers, so let's see how we did. A security administrator is gathering data from a compromised host. Which of the following should be gathered first? Is it any previous backups? Drive image, default router configuration, the TMP directory contents, or a memory dump. Let's see how you did with this one. We'll close the polling, and we can see 54% of us say we would choose a memory dump. 18% say grab the drive image. 15% say any previous backups. About 10% say the TMP directory contents. And then only 1% say the default router configuration. This is a question about the order of volatility. Volatility describes how, uh, how quickly data can disappear from existence. How volatile is it? Some data disappears really quickly. Some data takes a little bit more time before it disappears. And so this question is saying, you've got a compromised host. Now we need to begin gathering evidence what do we gather first so that we're able to capture as much evidence as possible before it disappears? Because all of this data has different levels of volatility. Here is a chart from my SY0601 exam, section 4.5 on forensics data acquisition. And this order of volatility has the most volatile data at the top. Things like your CPU registers are changing dramatically all the time. They are constantly changing out. We're constantly cycling through different, different items and materials in the CPU itself. So the CPU cache and the CPU registers are two types of data that are being changed constantly. Uh, things that are in the middle of this list are things like temporary file systems and monitoring data. Those types of data might stick around for a little bit longer. But eventually, they will disappear as well. And then finally, at the very bottom, things like archival media, things like backups, things like drive images, those are things that once you make the backup, once you create the drive image, the data is going to stick around for a little while. But eventually, you're going to throw those out after a year, after two years, after five years, whatever the policy is for your organization. Because all of that data is so old, it's not useful anymore. We need to do a new backup. We need to do a new drive image. 
uh, but that data is then ultimately it disappears as well. All of this data eventually will disappear. So as we look at the order of volatility, we need to figure out in our list what data is more volatile or the most volatile than any of the others. So we can look through our list. We know that we have backups and drive image. Those are effectively the same type of thing. Those are kind of archival data. And we can take the backup, but it's not going anywhere. If somebody takes a backup, they've got a tape, they've got an image, they've got something on disk, and it's sitting there. Well, it's not going anywhere unless we delete it. So of all of the things on this list, that's probably the least volatile of all of the data. Uh, something that is the default router configuration, routers rarely change. There's not much with a router configuration that that is that updates very, very often. Maybe you change it every week. There's an update to the router configuration, maybe even every month. Sometimes once you've got it configured, you don't touch it for a year. So the default router configuration is probably the next level up from archival media within this list. And then just up from there would be temporary files. Temporary files are files that are written by applications onto a section of the drive, usually in a temporary folder that is usually labeled temporary files. It might be labeled temp. It might be labeled TMP. But this temporary file area is one that is commonly storing files for an extended period of time. And then eventually those files will time out. And either the application will delete them or the operating system will delete them. Or if you've ever had to free up drive space in your operating system, there are many utilities that will go through and tell you, well, you've got this many gigabytes of data in your temporary files. We could delete those for you. And you're sure, yeah, delete those, free them up because they're used on a temporary basis, usually it doesn't hurt to be able to delete what's in your temporary folder. And then lastly, the thing that changes the most out of all of these, of those five items, the one that is the most volatile is the what's in memory. It's in the RAM of your system. Your memory in your system right now is changing constantly, all the time. So we need to grab as much as we can from that memory right now before anything else is overwritten so that we can have that stored for our evidence. That is the thing that you should gather first. If you chose memory dump, you got that one absolutely correct. That's what you should have chosen. That will absolutely protect your system and make sure that you're that protect the data uh, that you've gathered from memory so that you don't miss anything later on. If you spent your time, let me gather the backups. Let me go get the router configuration. Oh, let me capture all the files that are in the temp folder. While you're doing all of that, the memory in that system is now changing dramatically. You've now lost data from there. Uh, so that's what you would use is the memory dump. There's different memory dump options depending on the operating system that you're on. Uh, MemDump is a good utility to be able to do that in Windows, for example. Well, that's the answer we were looking for. Memory dump, if you answered 54% of you got that one right, you were absolutely correct on that one as well. Now, as you can already tell with the 601, there is a ton of of content you need to know on the 601. The exam themselves, the, the course that I, I created for the Security Plus 601 is 177 videos over 21 hours of information. It's a big exam. The 701 is a little bit smaller. There are about 121 videos in my course. I'm not sure what it came out to be, 15 hours, something like that. Somewhere in there, a little bit fewer, uh, amount, a different amount of data that's in there to be able to work with that. But for the 601, 120 pages of content, of notes. I went through every video of this course, and I took everything that was on every uh, video page, all of the charts, all of the graphics, and I created my course notes. These course notes, they are physical books that you can get for the 601 or 701. You can see they're they're about the same in, in size. The 601 is a little bit bigger. Uh, the information that's in these physical books is identical to the digital version that you see on your screen here. Let me kind of go through a couple of pages so you can get a feel for what the 601 has. So all of the important graphics, all of the charts, all of the text that's on the pages, they're all in here. So if you wanted a summary 
of all of these videos in one place, this is what you're looking for. It's my set of course notes. I have these available for the 601 or the 701. And they're both available in the digital form that you just saw online in PDF and a physical form, a physical book that you can purchase as well. If you purchase the physical edition, you get the digital one included for no additional charge. So you can download the digital one immediately while you're waiting on me to print this for you and to ship it to your address. And then you'll get this beautiful, perfect bound. That's what they call that binding that you have on a paperback book. A perfect bound, full color set of course notes uh, that is identical to the digital version. You can find out about all of these on my website. Visit professormesser.com slash 601cn. It's also a great way to support what we do here at professormesser.com. Keeps the lights on, and we thank you so much for your support uh, and, and your purchase and your ongoing support of these. We sure appreciate it. Let's do some more questions. I know we got the time is going so quickly. So let's get a few more of these in. This next question I have asks, a company loses $1,000 each time a tablet device is stolen. Which of the following would describe this information? Is that RPO, SLE, MTBF, RTO, or ALE? This is another one of these questions, by the way, that applies to both the 601 and the 701. So regardless of which exam you're planning to take, absolutely, you should answer this one. The question again asks, if a company loses $1,000 each time, a company loses $1,000 each time a, de a tablet device is stolen, which of the following would describe this information? Is that RPO, SLE, MTBF, RTO, or ALE? If you think you know the answer... Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. There's the link at the bottom of the screen. Make sure you put that on there and see how well you know this particular question. This should be one of those also that if you've ever sort of worked through uh, this myriad of abbreviations on these exams, it's almost overwhelming. But it, this is one of those that if you know what the abbreviation means, it might help you answer the question. That's not always the case. But in this case, it does happen to be that way. So let's see if you happen to know what this one is. A lot of you have put in your answer on this one. A lot of people think they know this one pretty solid. So let's see how you did with this one. The question asks, a company loses $1,000 each time a tablet device is stolen. Which of the following would describe this information? Is it... RPO, SLE, MTBF, RTO, or ALE. Let's stop the polling and see how you did with this one. We can see that SLE is 58% of the answers on this one. You've got uh, a number 10% of you, or 18% of you, chose ALE. 10% chose RPO, and then we have single digits for 6% for RTO and 5% for MTBF. Now, all of the, almost all of these have something to do with assessing risk. And one of the things that you run into when you start trying to put a dollar sign to risk is you have a number of calculations that you can do. One of these is the annualized rate of occurrence, which describes how often this thing happens. So uh, that wasn't one of the, answer, the, the possibilities we had, but this is certainly a consideration you have to know about this one. If you lose, or, uh, uh, lose a particular device or that device is destroyed or you have to replace it, there's obviously a cost associated with that. And we refer to that as a single loss expect expectancy. We know that as if we're planning this, we're a big company, and we know that many things happen with a big company. We have thousands of people in the field, and there would be a certain number of tablets that get stolen throughout the year. We just expect it. It is, it is statistics. It is life. Uh, and we have, to, uh, we have to prepare for that risk should that data be stolen, should those devices be stolen. So we need to put a dollar value with the device itself. And for example, if it is a tablet or a laptop, let's say that's $1,000. Each time that device is stolen, that costs us about $1,000. And we refer to that as an SLE, a single loss expectancy. And that is indeed 
what 58, almost 59% of you chose was SLE. That is the right answer. That's what we were looking for in this case is a single loss expectancy. Now, there are other things that we could calculate. Things like an annualized loss expectancy would be how many times we expect this particular event to occur times how much it costs us. So if each tablet is $1,000 and we expect that seven of these are going to be lost in a year, for an entire year, we would lose $7,000 just in tablets that are stolen. So that gives us an idea of how we might position some type of, of risk analysis. And we might want to say, well, it's $7,000. We're going to take that risk ourselves. And if we'll just uh, we'll support that with the money that we make from the company. Or you may be looking at this and saying, well, there is an insurance company that has a policy. And for $5,000 a year, they will insure every tablet that we have from stolen, from being stolen. Well, the, that is $5,000 and the tablets cost us seven. There's your business analysis. There's your financial analysis on this one. We can purchase a... Uh, an insurance policy for $5,000 and would save us $2,000 over the next 12 months. So that's why we create these different types of analyses, especially those that have some type of raw numbers associated with them, because it gives us a way that we can make a business decision because we have these raw numbers. So things like the meantime between failures, the RPO and the RTO are really referring to getting back up and running after an outage. They do not refer to uh, any type of quantitative risk analysis, or at least determining from a quantitative perspective, the risk analysis, but RPO uh, or excuse me, SLE and ALE certainly do. We've already seen those particular abbreviations. In this case, SLE is the one we were looking for. 59% or so of you did choose that option, and that is the right option. That's the one we were looking for in this question. And if you're someone who's trying to calculate all of these different risk analysis numbers, you'll want to start with those abbreviations. Those are, and as I mentioned, those are are also in the 601 and the 701. So make sure you're familiar with those, regardless of which version of the exam you're planning to take. Let's do another question. I believe this one is also a 601-701 question. So this might be good for many of you. This next question asks, a team in the security department is responsible for scanning and exploiting vulnerabilities on the company network. Which of the following would best describe this team? Would that be blue, white, purple, green, or red? It's, it's just a bunch of colors. A team in the security department is responsible for scanning and exploiting vulnerabilities on the company network. Which of the following would best describe this team? Is it blue, white, purple, green, or red? Let's see if you know what these happen to be. If you know the answer, please follow the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you know which one this happens to be. Uh, this is one that you do need to know because understanding the different roles in a security department will be important if you begin working on these. Make sure you're familiar with these different uh, these different teams because there are a number of different teams you could be placed into. So make sure you step through all of these and become a little more familiar with what these different teams can do, what the different options are, and, and the different expectations for these teams. These should be good ones to go with. See if you happen to know what this is. You can answer it at professormesser.com slash QA. See if you know what these are. These questions that we get are, are important. Now, if you are someone who is... Uh, you already have your Security Plus, your A Plus, your Network Plus, and you're using continuing education unit credit to be able to renew your certification. I will be glad to email you with a certification of a one hour webinar category CEU. The way that you earn that email is you go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. And you click the Contact Us link. In that Contact Us link, a form will appear. Put your name, your email address. In the subject line, put December 2023 Security Plus. And in the body of the message on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, Security Department. 
Security Department are the super secret code words of the month. Yep, we just make these up on the fly as we go. This is the way it works. So again, if you want to uh, receive one of these emails, go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, click the Contact Us link, put your name, your email address in the subject line, put December 2023 Security Plus, and in the body of the message on a line by itself, put the words Security Department. You could also put anything else you would like into the rest of the body of that message. I read through every single one of these, and thank you, all of you that put messages in there, I do enjoy reading through them. Uh, it usually takes me about a week to go through these and get them back to you. Sometimes they get to you faster. Sometimes they get back to you a little bit slower. But I try to get it to you within seven days in any case. We'll probably do these later on this week, get them out of the way before the big holiday rush shows up. Let's see how you did with this one. A team in the security department is responsible for scanning and exploiting vulnerabilities on the company network. Which of the following would best describe this team? Is it the blue team, the white team, the purple team, the green team, or the red team? Let's see what you think it is. And we have 75% of us that say it is the red team. We've got 11%, though, that say it's the blue team. And we have 5%, really 6% say purple, 6% say white, and then 0.5% say it's the green team. I, would, I wish it was the A team or the something like this should be a different term other than colors. But there it is. That's what we came up with in this case. Because this team is both scanning and exploiting vulnerabilities on the network, it is more of an offensive task. It is where this team is actively going out to devices to try to find one that is vulnerable. And if it is vulnerable, they're going to try to gain access to that system by exploiting that vulnerability that is clearly in the area that the red team would handle. This is your offensive security team. This is the one where you've now got people effectively attacking your own systems. And it's the red team that does this. Now, obviously, this is a team that works for you or they do work for you. Uh, they work at your company or for your company. And so this is what we would refer to as more of an ethical hack, if you will being able to work that through. So if they are able to gain access to a system by exploiting a vulnerability, maybe they're calling the help desk and saying, hi, this is Larry. I'm in the marketing department, and I need to have my password reset and see if the help desk actually does it. Hopefully, they're better at doing this than I am. Uh, this, obviously, that's what happened, as a matter of fact, with the, that I believe that was the MGM hack. Wasn't they, didn't they call the help desk and say, oh, I need my password reset. Oh, sure, reset. There you go. Okay, now I have access to your whole systems. Thank you so much. Uh, brought that whole, whole network down very quickly. This happens, by the way, more times than you might think. It is an easy way in. And if you have people inside the company on the red team performing the same type of social engineering, maybe you can fix that problem before somebody else is able to exploit it. So pretty happy uh, finding those. That red team is the right answer. 75% of you chose that one. If your team was the one that was more on the defensive side, where you were trying to protect your system from these, then it's the blue team. And if it's a combination where you're doing both, you're both protecting systems and trying to exploit systems, then you're probably a combination of red and blue, or you're the purple team. The white team is usually for management, for someone who is overseeing this entire process. And the green team is completely made up. We generally don't see green teams. It's not completely made up. Someone probably somewhere has a green team. Uh, but it's not one that we would commonly associate with teams for security processes. Green is not one that we would use. The accounting department, that's the green team. Uh, in our case, for security, if you're actively looking for vulnerabilities and you're actively trying to exploit those vulnerabilities, then you are part of the red team. And that is the correct answer. Red team, 75% of you got that one absolutely correct. So well done with your red team question. Now, I know it's the top of the hour, but I do have another question here that I would like to give you. This next question, though, is one that I created just for the 601 exam. It's from my practice exams. So if you have my practice exams, you may have even seen this one before and work through them. Uh, this is obviously an important uh, consideration. If you've gone through the videos and the books and you've done some labs and you've studied all of the exam objectives, you may want to test yourself. And of course, we create practice exam books 
that allow you to test yourself if you're part of the 601 study group. You're working on those. We have a 601 practice exams book. There it is. There it is. Very nice. It's very fuzzy. Uh, the 601 book is available both in a digital form and a physical form. Uh, and again, if you get the physical book, you get the digital version at no additional cost. Uh, let's go through a practice exam question from our 601 book. For those of you that are working in your 701, our 701 book should be available to you sometime in the coming months. These things do take time to write, uh, but it's coming along quite nicely. We're already in production with that one. We're already working on the questions for that one. It's coming along quite nicely. But I have for you a question directly from my practice exams book. This is on page 98 of my practice exams book. Again, no answers in the chat room, please. No hints in the chat room. Let's go through this one. And we know that this question asks, it's question A59 that asks, a Linux administrator is downloading an updated version of her Linux distribution. The download site shows a link to the ISO and a SHA-256 hash value. Which of these would describe the use of this hash value? Verifies that the file was not corrupted during the file transfer. Provides a key for decrypting the ISO after download. Authenticates the site as an official ISO distribution site or confirms that the file does not contain any malware. Now, in, when you start with this and work through this question in the book, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that all of these questions are written together. So I'm looking at the answers here. You can see the answer on your screen. You would normally start this on the other part of this. So I'm going to go up to A59 that's in the actual Q&A section so you can get a feel for what that looks like. So when you're working through the book itself, it's just one question after another. But I want to show you these links because this is what provides kind of the, the hook for this. The questions that you see at the beginning are here. And then it says a quick answer is on page 33. The details are on page 98. So that, that gives you at least a little bit to work through. And when we go to the details, the answer and the incorrect answers are all on this page. People in the chat room have been saying, yeah, it's all on the page. It's exactly the way it should be. So you can see on A59, the answer is A. And we describe that that's what the answer is. And we give you a description of why that's the correct answer. It's right there. So the other part of this, though, is that there were other answers here that were not correct. So in this book, for every incorrect answer, I detail why it is an incorrect answer. That's something you don't often find in other types of practice exams. Because I think that's a good opportunity to learn, especially if you get the question wrong. I guess it's useful to know what the right answer is. But perhaps more importantly, I thought it was B. Why is it not B? And then we can explain, oh, well, uh, ISO files containing public information distributed without encryption, a hash value would not commonly be used as a decryption key. So you can at least understand what the, the reasoning was behind that being the wrong answer. And you can go through every wrong answer. I'll even tell you, for those of you that have this book, the thing that I will highly recommend is even if you knew the answer was A, that it verifies that the file was not corrupted during the file transfer, I highly recommend you go through and read the incorrect answers because the content in the incorrect answers could show up as a question on the actual exam. So it's important to read through all of these. They're all in the book. It's all available. And because we've now jumped to this page, I can click the back button in my PDF reader, and I'm back to where I started. So those links that we have on the page are very nifty. Allows you to jump very quickly to the answers and then jump back to the actual question. So uh, a nice way to move very quickly digitally through the file. Obviously, if you have the book, you can simply fast forward through the book and find the page that has those answers on it and bookmark it and hold a spot there do a doggy or whatever makes sense for you to be able to find those. So that's an important part of this. Uh, again, this is the 601 practice exams. This would not be the practice exams you would use for the 701. The two exams are dramatically different in their content. The 701, for example, half of the 701, 50% of that exam is new content. So just to give you an idea of why you shouldn't use a 601 book, to take the 701 exam, that's why. And we will have a 701 practice exams book out as well. That 701 practice exams book will be available over the coming months. You'll see it uh, come out as soon as we finish it. It'll be published, and you'll be able to use those too. So that's an important consideration. If you'd like more information on those, they're on my website, professormesser.com security pd.
E. Everything we've talked about today comes directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. These objectives contain everything you need to know to pass the exam. They are extensive. They are bulleted. They give you more information. CompTIA gives you more information than any other certification body in the IT industry. You know before you walk into the room what's expected of you because they tell you at a very, very detailed level. Microsoft doesn't do this. Cisco doesn't do this. Amazon doesn't do this. Nobody does this but CompTIA. Very few people. I've seen maybe one other organization provide this level of detail. Uh, but this is unusual but valuable. This is very valuable, and it's free. You can download this from the CompTIA website. I have a link over to the CompTIA website. Go to professormesser.com slash objectives and follow the link from there. Or go to your favorite search engine, type in CompTIA exam objectives, and you'll be able to find that very, very, very quickly. So very useful to be able to, uh, to find exactly what you need to know. Because that's the question people ask. How do I know that I'm ready to take the exam? You go through this list and you check off every bullet. If you know every single bullet, you'll be in good shape. You'll be ready to take your exam. In fact, if you know every single bullet in these exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. That's how, how, how secure and solid I am in saying that because everything you need to know is in these. In fact, don't go outside the scope of these exam objectives. If you, if you see other study materials that are asking you things that aren't in the objectives, you can, can rightfully ignore them because they did not use the exam objectives to be able to provide you with an understanding of what's expected of you for the exam. I use these objectives to build every single video I create so you know that everything that I provide to you is specifically listed in the exam objectives, and you can follow along with them to know what those are. It's the same format I use for my videos, for my course notes, and you'll be able to match those up quite nicely with the book that you happen to be using. We do one of these study groups every month. This is our last study group of the calendar year. There are no more live streams for the rest of 2023. So we've got, uh, of course, study groups we'll be doing in January. Um, and we have a plus study group on, on the 5th and the 7th, uh, or excuse me, the 9th and 11th of January. We've got a, on the 17th of January is our Network Plus study group. And the 24th of January, we've currently scheduled for our Security Plus study group. A lot of information in all of these. The difference in January, however, is that this Security Plus study group will be a 701 study group. So we're switching over from our 601 to the 701. So not only is this the last Security Plus study group of the year and our last live stream of the year, this is the last SY0601 study group forever. Well, at least for the, for the time being. We don't plan on doing any more 601 study groups going forward. We're switching over, but it's okay. You've got three years plus of 601 study groups that are all available on our playlist and our replay index. You can go through every single one of those to gather information about the 601 exam. Well, we're through the first hour of this, but stick around. We've got an after show coming up, and you folks have already been adding questions. If you want to add a question, you can go into VVox right now, professormesser.com slash QA, and put, a, and put a question in there. I'll be glad to look through those. Don't forget about our daily pop quiz questions. They're on Twitter. They're on Instagram. And, of course, our entire set of training materials for both the 601 and 701 are available on YouTube right now. Go to professormesser.com slash Twitter slash Instagram and slash YouTube to find all of those. Don't forget about our Exam Hacks ebook that comes for free with our vouchers. You can find that at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And of course, our course notes and practice exams are all on the Professor Messer website. Stick around for the next hour. I'm going to be taking questions that you have submitted. We've got a lot to go through. It's always a good time in the after show. Stick around for that. Otherwise, we will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let me take a sip, a beverage. And it's time for the after show, everybody. This is our study group after show. In the after show, it's a little more laid back. We don't have any formal questions that I have written for you. Instead, you have questions that you have written for me. So the way that you would 
submit your questions as you go to our VVox app. Well, that would not be it. There it is. You go to VVox, uh, which you can find very easily by going to professormesser.com slash QA, and you can submit that right at the top of the page. There's a tab that you can switch over to the Q&A. And you can submit those questions at any time. Whether I'm talking through a question or not, working through all of those, uh, they are, they are, I can see them on my side. So don't worry. When you submit them, I can see them. No problem there. So you're more than happy to submit questions in that VBOX front end. I'm going to quickly go through here. Lots of questions already waiting on us. I saw a number of questions going through um, in the chat room. But if you want your question to be seen, uh, sometimes they go by really fast in the chat room. So submit them via professormesser.com slash QA. It's one of the best ways to submit the questions so that I can see all of these to be able to work through. And in fact, I'll work through a couple of them right now. We'll have a look at them. Let's start with one that comes from Ace. Hi, Ace. I enjoyed you when you were in that band. The makeup did a great job. After I get my trifecta, I'm trying to go to school to get my cybersecurity engineering master's. Do you think it's a good it's good to work at a help desk job while going to school? Well, this is a there's a couple of things to consider here. Generally speaking, yes, absolutely. That's a good idea to get a job working at a help desk. In fact, that's most of the time entry level position into IT often begins at the help desk. It's not the only entry-level job available in IT, but it's one of the common entry-level positions you'll find. If you can get a job working at a help desk, that has practical experience, goes on your resume, and that will work very well for you when it comes time to be looking for a position. Now, I will tell you, there's a, there's a balancing act, of course. If you're taking college classes and being a college student, um, the, there is... A balancing act you have to have between your academics, which are the most important thing, and then everything else. Your extracurriculars, there's party time, there's hanging out at the sorority house, there's, maybe that's just me, but there's also jobs. And I had a job through college, but when you have a job, it takes time away from the academic side. So there, that's the balancing act. I think my parents would have rathered I not worked at uh, during my time at school, they would, I think they probably would have preferred me spending more time with academics. But as I told them, not having a job doesn't guarantee that I'm going to spend more time with academics. I already knew myself, already knew what a bad student I was at that point, but I made it through. I did get my degree. So perhaps I wasn't as bad as I thought I was. Um, but that's your balancing act. Another thing to consider, of course, is that uh, there are not a lot of entry level jobs in security, in IT security when you put it relative to everything else that's available. There are a lot of entry-level jobs available in a help desk, service desk. There's a lot of entry-level jobs available at a network operations center or a NOC. And there are a lot of jobs, entry-level jobs, or a number of entry-level jobs available at a security operations center or a SOC. Um, if you're in a big area, you're in a, a large metropolitan area with very large companies, they may have security operations centers that are in that particular geography, and they may be hiring people to work as that first line of, of engineer in a, in a security operations center. That would be ideal if you were interested in getting into security in the future. But it doesn't matter if you're planning on getting into security in the future, any entry-level job in IT is good. Because we don't generally start in security when we have a job in IT. Most of the time, IT security positions are for people that have already have gathered a large foundational knowledge in operating systems, networking, and to some degree, a good bit of security. So you have to kind of, to work your, you kind of have to work yourself up into the level of cybersecurity which I don't like that term because it doesn't mean anything. I generally will use IT security because it really speaks to what we're talking about here, which is a job where you're on the blue team, the red team, the purple team, that group of people. Um, that team, those groups of folks, are responsible for keeping your systems up and running, making sure that your data is safe, making sure that people have the correct access to data, and resolving any problems that might occur with different security incidents. That's information technology. And for somebody who's working towards their master's degree, you will certainly have a good degree that you can apply 
when you're putting in for these particular positions. But just already you should, in your mind, know that there are a limited number of security positions available at the entry level. So have some flexibility with your strategy here. Getting in the door is the most important thing. So if you're somebody who is working through getting in the door for anything relating to security, uh, get a, any job that's available in IT, you can easily work into security from there. Get a help desk position, service desk position, remote uh, troubleshooting, uh, uh, on, an on-call technician. Whatever you can do, get the job because that gives you practical IT experience that you can easily use to move up to higher level positions in an organization or to different organizations. So that's what I would recommend too. If you're planning that process, I think that is a great idea to get a job working at a help desk while going to school because you'll be able, once you get out of school, you've got practical experience on your resume. You're already ahead of the game. And as long as you can balance that out with your academics and it's not causing your academics to suffer, I think that's a great idea. So absolutely uh, work through that. Um, a question um, that came in the chat room, this is one that came in the pre-show as well, are folks that ask, should I take the 601 exam or should I take the 701 exam? And I think at this point, you do have to make a decision about these. They are different exams. They're dramatically different exams. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a breakdown of how dramatic the differences are between these in just a bit. The two exams, the 601 is a little bit bigger, 701 is a little bit smaller. 601 has been around for much longer, though. There are many more books and many more videos and many more training materials available for the 601. 701 has been out just over a month, not very long in the world of publishing. There will be additional books and study materials for that published over the next number of months. So it takes a while whenever these exams first come out for all of those study materials to finally hit the market. That's perfectly normal. It happens every single time. But you have to consider that if you're somebody who's maybe looking at the 701 and you're thinking, wow, there's a lot more 601 books than there is 701. Yep, that's perfectly normal. But in about three months from now, it'll start to even itself out a little bit. It happens pretty quick. So that'll be a good time to maybe... The, have everything at parity. But at, at this point, you, if you're jumping into the 701, just know that there are books available, there are videos available, there are things available to study from, but it's certainly not the, the large quantity that you would find on the 601 side. But let me throw some of these numbers at you because I think this is a good number to start with. I'm going to grab some statistics about the 601 and 701 just so you can understand the numbers that I'm working through. Um, in fact, I'll, maybe I'll just I'll just share the entire document that I have here, just so you can kind of see the breakdown. Whenever I build um, these these uh, videos, I create an extensive set of spreadsheets that every line of the spreadsheet is a separate bullet from the exam objective. So every objective has its own line in my spreadsheet. And what I do is go through this spreadsheet and I evaluate how much information was removed from the 601 when the 701 was created. How much was dropped completely that never shows up on the 701. And also conversely, how much of the 701 information is brand new. So I like to evaluate and really get a kind of a quantitative analysis of the objectives. So this is at a pure numbers level. We're sort of looking at the differences between these exams. Now, admittedly, the, you lose the nuance when you're dealing with numbers at this level, but it does tell a story. So this is the spreadsheet that I use to tell the story. This is it right here. So the total number of objectives on the SY0601 was just over 1,000, 1,038. We'll just call it 1,000 just so we can count easier. So there are 1,000 objectives on the 601. On the 701, and by the way, when the 601 came out, I, I was amazed at how big this exam was. There's a lot more to this exam. Clearly the largest exam CompT had ever created and continues to be the largest exam that they have available in their 15 or so certifications that they offer. That's a lot. So on the 701, I think they corrected things a bit from a size perspective. And for the 701, there are 662 objectives on the 701. So quite a difference in quantity. 
Now, as I mentioned, it's not any harder or easier than each other. They both are, I think, at pretty much the same difficulty level. But obviously, there are 36% less objectives on the 701 exam. And when you're studying, that might make a difference. There's less to study. I think ultimately, that's a pretty big difference. 36% smaller is a significant difference. So that is why I often say, yeah, we should probably uh, think about what we're doing with this and and how which one we would choose based on just raw numbers. The, the 701 is relatively smaller than the 601. But let's really break down what those differences are. So if we look at the 701 exam, there are 338 objectives on the 701 that aren't even on the 601. So 51% of the 701 exam, all brand new content, all brand new. There's, there's 51, half, the, half of the 701 exam isn't in your 601 book, if I can put it that way. And that's why I tell people all the time, do not use a 601 book to study for the 701 because half of the 701 isn't in that 601 book. Here's what's even crazier. I went back to the 601 exam objectives and I counted how many objectives on the 601 never appear on the 701. 64% of the objectives, 667 objectives are completely missing now. That's how much was dropped out of the 601 when they went to the 701. And again, that's why I tell people, don't study from 601 materials if you're planning to take the 701. You're studying way more than you should. 64% of the 601 exam no longer exists on the 701. That is a dramatic difference. That is a big number difference. And that's why I tell people uh, very specifically that you do not want to be in a position where you are going to study from different materials because you'll walk into your exam and see things you weren't expecting to see. Very, very important to know this. So that's why I tell people Make sure you're locked in. That's why if you're taking the 701, get the 701 materials. Do not buy 601 materials. You will be sorry. You'll be super sorry. Do not. I don't want you in that position either. Don't be in that position. And there's a good number of 701 materials available. So that's the idea is to kind of break it down that way. I will also say, and, and as a follow-up to that, um, uh, folks in the chat room have asked a number of times, so what, is there a difference in how the two versions are perceived? That's a good question. That's a valid question. So if you take the 601 exam, you earn a Security Plus certification. If you take the 701 exam, you also earn a Security Plus certification. So that is exactly the same. You earn the same piece of paper. You just took a different exam to get there. Um, and so for that reason, employers don't care which version of the exam you take. Uh, every employer I've ever spoken to said, no, I don't care. I'm just looking for somebody who's Security Plus certified. In fact, let's say that you took your Security Plus exam 10 years ago. Let's say you took the 401 version. The SY0401 was 10 years ago. Let's say you took that version of the exam and passed your certification. And then every three years, you've renewed your certification until today, and your certification continues to be renewed. But you didn't take the 601. You didn't take the 701. But you are just as Security Plus certified as someone who does take the 601 and pass it and somebody who does take the 701 and pass it. So that's why employers don't care how you got the certification. What they care about is that you have it. And that's the important part. So I don't care if you take the 601. I don't care if you take the 701. Whichever one fits you, whichever one you're more comfortable with, whichever one you've got study materials for, take that one. That's the, the real key. And I think that if you're somebody who is uh, working their way to get a job using that certification, doesn't matter how you get the cert, just get it. Just earn the certification. And that's the important part of this. So uh, think about those. Continue um, with your process of evaluating the differences between. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll put it and I'll, I'll sort of put the, the cherry on the top of this. We'll summarize this. Um, let's say that I was going to take the exam right now. It takes me a good six months to study for a certification exam. I've got a full-time job. I've got a family. It's the holiday season. I got stuff happening at the beginning of the year. There's life. 
And I don't get through an exam study in two months or three months. It takes me six months. So already I know that if I started on the 601 right now, I would be coming up right at the end of its lifetime, of its availability, not just its lifetime, but how quickly I can take the exam. I'm coming up on the final days of it. That's not good timing. So if I was going to take my uh, and choose an exam right now, I would choose the 701 because there's no way I would finish it and, and be comfortable with that, that deadline. It's not good to have a deadline when you're working on an industry certification exam. So to avoid the deadline, I would go with the 701. But let's say you've been studying for the 601. You've been studying for three months. You've gone through every exam objective. You've read the book. You're now going through the videos. Maybe you're doing a little Q&A. Maybe you've got a lab you're going through. And now suddenly the 701's out and you're thinking, oh, should I, should I go take the 701? Should I shift gears? Should I go do that? No, you've spent months studying the 601 materials. Finish it up, go take the exam, and you're good. You'll pass it, and just like everybody for the last three years has taken the 601 exam. You go take that 601 exam and pass it. Do not start over because I've, I've already shown you the 701 exam is a very different exam. You're effectively having to start over at the beginning to make sure that you get every single one of those objectives in. So that's your decision to make, of course. But I want you to be as I want you to be happy with the exam you're taking, but I also don't want you to spend more time than is necessary to study the materials that will earn you that certification. So we got a balancing act right now. Now, fortunately, as we move on into 2024, as we get into March and April, we're now coming up on a real tight deadline. And I think pretty much everybody at that point well, who's starting new will probably go into the 701. But I will tell you, having gone through this two, three, four, five, six, seven times now with these migrations between versions of exams, there will be people taking the 601 exam on July 31st, 2024. They will be taking this exam up until the last day it is available. So don't worry yourself that you're thinking, oh, I'm studying old content. You're not. I'm studying things that uh, that are now out of date. You're not. Uh, I'm studying things that um, that are now. I'm having to to take this exam, and it's now overwhelming with the amount of information. It's not. People have taken this exam the last three years, so that's the idea: is being able to figure it out, whatever f works for you. Now, if you feel in your, some people feel that. The 701's out. It's new. It's shiny. People are talking about it. That's the one I want to take. That's probably not the best rationale. You should probably think along the lines of which is best for me rather than what's shiny and what's flashy and what are people talking about. It's an important consideration. Now, uh, there was a question also earlier where people said, well, then how do I buy a voucher for this? Uh, because I don't know which one I'm going to take yet. Uh, but I need to buy a voucher for these. Well, fortunately, the vouchers that you would buy are not versioned. So a Security Plus voucher can be used for a 601 exam or a 701 exam. Any available Security Plus exam, that voucher is good for. Now, I know if you go to the CompTIA website, you buy your voucher from there. First, why are you doing that? I guess maybe if you're in a different country, uh, if you're in uh, the U.S. or Canada, you should buy your voucher at professormester.com slash vouchers. But if you're not or you choose to buy it from some other place, they may even say, this is a 601 voucher, and this is a 701 voucher. And CompT even says that on their website. Here's the secret. It's the same voucher. Exactly the same voucher. There's no difference. There, there literally is no difference in the vouchers. Uh, you can use that same voucher for 601. You can use it for 701. It doesn't matter. Now, obviously, as soon as you use it, the voucher is no good anymore. You've now locked in which version of the exam you're going to take. So you have to be careful at that point which one you choose. But as far as the voucher is concerned, a Security Plus voucher is a Security Plus voucher is a Security Plus voucher. So it doesn't matter. They are not numbered. They're not versioned. Um, all of that. The vouchers on my site are good if you live in Canada, the U.S., or a U.S. territory. They cannot be used by people who are physically located and will be taking their exam from a different country, unfortunately. So sad. But maybe next time we'll work through that. So hopefully that's kind of giving you a summary of the 601-701 differences and my rationale behind what I tell you in 
uh, getting the books you need and the other things. There's some folks on the on the internet have sent me notes. Oddly enough, I get emails from people saying, you're telling people there are dramatic differences between these two exams. I read there's only six differences. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's very funny when I get those messages because I know that there are a thousand differences. And here they are. Uh, there's over a thousand differences. Uh, with everything that was dropped and everything that was added, I guess we're at, what's the total number? Between what it was dropped, we had, let's do the numbers because I, I have to know, right? Uh, the numbers, I, and I closed out my closed out my tab, so it's not. Oh, there it is. So, six uh, of this, six hundred and sixty-two. There's a difference here of three hundred and thirty-eight objectives and six hundred sixty-seven. Yeah, we're over a thousand thousand differences between these two exams. Um, not a, not an insignificant number. So that's why I tell people make sure you uh, you get the right things. Big differences there. It's not six. It's a thousand. There's a big difference there. Now, and as I mentioned, of course, when you're looking at just uh, objective by objective by objective, those statistics are, are very myopic. You're really looking at a granular level, and some people might argue you're looking too close. You need to look broader. Well, with a 1,000 objectives that are changed, let's just say that 10% of them are different. Well, that's 100 differences. That's more than six as well. But the reality is you have to know every objective. If there are 700 objectives, you have to know all 700 of those things. So in my mind, for someone who's studied for a lot of industry certification exams, someone who's created content and training materials for a number of industry certification exams, those objective numbers are actually, I think, more important than a broad painting of what is different in these two exams. Get down to the very detailed level because you're studying at that very detailed level, and I think that's important to know. Let's do some more questions from you. I'm going to flip through. I haven't been reading these, so I should probably uh, keep my eye on this list of questions that you have here. I'm going to scroll, scroll, scroll here pretty quick. Um, along the line, since we're talking about vouchers, Anonymous has written in and says, will you be selling vouchers that are valid outside of the United States. Uh, we've talked about this before uh, and having these vouchers available. Um, and it's, it is a, a challenging problem if you live in one country to sell vouchers that must be sold in the currency of a different country. And it becomes more difficult to tax and then move those dollars between these different countries. There are many challenges behind this. Some are financial, some are legal, uh, and some are just accounting challenges. So we have not really found a good way to do that yet. Uh, we found a couple of ways to consider doing that. And I might, I might even be working more on how to kind of break some of these things down. But currently, our vouchers are only available for people that are physically located in the U.S., Canada or a U.S. territory. Um, and in fact, I will tell you that, it, that one of the things I found when doing these vouchers is that there is a U.S. territory called the Mariana Islands. It's in the Pacific. And CompTIA did not categorize the Mariana Islands as a U.S. territory. It was in, it was in their international store. And I sent them a note saying, you know, that's the U.S. Just like Guam. Guam is nearby. Relatively speaking, Guam is certainly a U.S. territory, and it's qualified and categorized as a U.S. territory on the CompTIA website. And so they're moving over the Mariana Islands here after the first of the year. So I was happy to see that, too. So we really do have every U.S. territory listed in there now, which is very good. But outside the U.S., yes, I'm so sorry, uh, and working through those um, and being able to understand the details of that. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of work through that as we go along. Hopefully, I can find some other ideas on how I might provide vouchers for other countries, but currently only available for Canada, U.S., and U.S. territories. So sorry. Um, let's keep going through this list. Um, here is a, a logistics question and a good logistics question from my good friend Anonymous who asks, if I book an exam date, can that date be rescheduled because of unforeseen events like travel, you're sick, there's a life event, uh, life happens. These things happen all the time. So the real question people might have is, how do you handle that? Uh, and how do you reschedule? 
on these exams. There is a reschedule policy for CompTIA exams. Uh, that reschedule policy is out on Pearson View because they're the ones that kind of manage this process uh, when you're working through them. I'm looking for a link that hopefully would be on the CompTIA site, though. Ultimately, it's CompTIA that decides their policies. And on their website, they do have a candidate testing policies page. Just search for CompTIA candidate testing policies. It'll bring you to this page where they talk about accommodations during the exam, English as a second language. Some of you may not realize this. If English is your second language, you can get a time extension uh, if you're uh, taking the exam in English. So that may be something that might be really, really helpful for you. Um, and they talk about some of the scoring and the exam content. But down here, they have the test center reschedule policy and the test center cancellation policy. So you can reschedule at least one full business day, 24 hours and a business day before the appointment via the website or the call center. And you, if you uh, reschedule less than 24 hours, then you will forfeit your exam fee. Ugh, that's painful. So don't do that. Don't reschedule less than 24 hours. And that's a business day, 24 hours. So we're not talking if it's if your exam is on Monday, you need to reschedule on Friday at least 24 hours before that exam on Monday. Because Saturday is not a business day. Sunday is not a business day, just for those of you doing the counting. Uh, cancellation similar, that you must cancel at least one full business day before the appointment via the website or call center. And if you do that, you'll if you don't do that within 24 hours of uh, a business day, it will result in a forfeiture. Um, and then they say exam schedule with certain accommodations may take up to three days to reschedule. So they they do have some options there for rescheduling and cancellation. The real takeaway there, make sure that it is within a 24-hour business day before that event. I'll also tell you, for those of you that are listening in that have to reschedule your exam, if you go to the website and you reschedule the exam, take a screenshot. And after you reschedule, go back in to look at your scheduling to confirm that your exam was really rescheduled. And the reason I say this is that a number of people, this has happened more than once. I don't know what's going on because I haven't done it myself. But more than once, uh, people have reported that they have changed and, and pushed their exam out. They have rescheduled it on the website. Then they show up on the day that they rescheduled it for, and they find that their exam never got changed, that it's still at the original date which they didn't show up for, and therefore they have now forfeited their exam fee. That is not the place you want to be. So I highly, highly recommend that you screenshot when you make the change. When it says your change is confirmed, you, this is your new day, make a screenshot of that. Then once you then log out, immediately log back in and check, does it show my schedule? And make a screenshot of that as well. That way, if you do run into a problem, it will either show up immediately that it say, wait, it still shows the same day. Let's try this again. Or when you get to this, the day that you reschedule, you can say, nope, I've got evidence that shows you told me it was this new day. Your system has got a problem. I suspect that may be what's going on. So get evidence when you make those changes. That's sort of what we do on the internet anyway. You should already be in that mode. You're a Security Plus person now. You're a security-minded individual. You should already be looking for evidence. You should already be gathering evidence with everything that you do online. Uh, and screenshots is a great way to gather evidence. Um, and, and it helps a lot if you run into a problem. So do that absolutely uh, if you're running into that situation, uh, an important consideration. Um, other questions on exam take, and I'll take one of these from the chat room since it sort of is, is blending in with the rest of these, is that some people like taking their exams at a testing center. Some people like taking their exam at home. You can take your exam at home. There's a way to do this. There's additional set of processes and procedures you must follow if you take your exam at home because your home obviously is not a secure exam testing environment. So you have to set up your desk in a particular way. You can only use one monitor. Um, you can't have certain things on your desk. Uh, you have to make sure that you follow their rules. You have to have a camera. Uh, you have to be able to uh, hear 
uh, what's coming in from your computer, or they have to be able to hear you with the microphone, rather. Um, so there's some important things to think about if you're setting this up. Obviously, in my studio, we have uh, the studio here. I've got a few monitors here. There's stuff all over my... This would never work to take an exam. They would see this and immediately say, nope, you may not take an exam in this environment. But if this was an empty desk, a laptop, and that's it, that's, that's more like it. All of the rules and all of the regulations are listed in detail on the CompTIA website. So if you wanted to take your exam at home, just think about it that way. Um, there are a number of technical challenges that people have run into, especially if your network connection is a little iffy, if you run into problems with the network connection in the middle of the exam, if there is a problem with your operating system or the security of your operating system or the browser that you're using, not everything works perfectly every single time. So I would recommend you read through some of the experiences that people have had on maybe the CompTIA subreddit. So go to reddit.com slash r slash CompTIA. People all the time leave uh, messages in there and posts about their experience taking the exam at home. And sometimes it works perfectly. Sometimes it does not. But the more you know about the process, the more you'll be ready if a problem does occur. For example, if you're in a testing center, you might be in front of this screen and trying to look at this question and think, oh, this is a tough one. Let me think about this. Uh, so if I did this, if you were taking your exam at home, you would immediately get a message on your screen from the proctor that says, take your hand away from your face. They don't like your hand near your face because you could be, you could be saying something right now. You could be saying the question into a recording device. It's, a, it's an environment they don't control. And you could certainly be doing that. So they don't like it when you cover your mouth. They don't like it when you talk. You can't say anything during the exam. We can't say anything in a testing center either. But in the testing center, if nobody's in there, you can kind of get away with it because nobody's in there. You aren't bothering anyone. But if you're at home, they can hear you. They can see you. And they will cancel your exam and say, you were cheating. Your exam is, oh, we stop it right here. Uh, whatever score you've got so far, that's your score. And your exam, you don't get a new exam. You forfeited any money associated with that. Hopefully you passed. Uh, the people have started their exam. They're on their first question. Uh, they drop something. They go out of the scope of their camera. And when they get back up, their exam has been canceled. Like, what? What just happened? Yeah, you moved out of the range of the camera. They couldn't see you. And that's something they won't allow. And they will cancel your exam immediately and you've lost all the money. So you have to be prepared. The home environment is a little bit different. There's a lot more writing on that environment. If I was to take an exam right now, if I was uh, planning to take any certification exam right now, I'd go to a testing center. I would. I just don't want to deal with the hassle of setting everything up and making it the right way. And then you run into waiting for people. Sometimes they overschedule the proctors and you're sitting there waiting an hour for your exam to start. Sometimes the exam crashes in the middle. Sometimes you can't move things around on the screen. There's, there's a number of, of, of ongoing technical problems they're trying to work through. So I would, to, uh, for, to avoid all of that, I just go to a testing center. That way, they deal with the computers. If there's a problem on the network, they're the ones having to deal with that. And they can, I, now I don't have any worries that if something happens to the testing environment when I'm there, it's their testing center. So they now have to reschedule me because I didn't have anything to do with the craziness that caused the problem. That was their doing. So now it's much easier to get the exam rescheduled. So that's what I would, I recommend. But not everybody can do that. Not everybody has, has a testing center down the street. Sometimes you're hours away from a testing center. Sometimes it's it's the middle of winter, in, or we're getting to winter, the middle of winter now in the United States. Um, and if that's the case, sometimes getting on the road is dangerous. It makes more sense to be at home. And in that case, absolutely take your exam at home. Um, that's that's a really important consideration. And, and just as long as you plan, just plan for the problem. Pl plan your expectations of what could happen. And when those things happen, it won't throw you. It's not going to be a concern. You'll be ready to deal with it, and you can you can address them when those problems occur. So that's what I would recommend. There's there's no right or wrong answer. It's really up to you. Just prepare for either one, regardless of which one you happen to choose. Let's do some more questions from 
the study group. Again, you can submit questions by going to the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA. Use the tab on the top of the screen to be able to submit your question. Um, along the lines of taking your exam at home, one of these questions, again, my good friend Anonymous asks, uh, can we use an external wired, oh, let's get you the screen up. Can we use an external wired mouse while taking the online exam from home? Well, I would I would think so. I'm using an, uh, a wired mouse. I just do a screensaver as I move the mouse out. Well, there we go. So here's, uh, here's my wired, that's a big mouse, isn't it? Here's my monster size mouse. This is literally called a hand shoe mouse. This is, this is, you're not seeing, this is right next to my face. So there's my face. There's my mouse. That's a big mouse. That's a, that's a, or maybe I have just a very small face. You don't know. But my whole hand fits on top of this mouse. It is, it is very ergonomic, which is why I have it. This is an older version that is wired. It's a USB mouse. They have a newer version now that's all wireless. I'm thinking of upgrading and have that there. Uh, but this is what I would use if I was taking, you can't even see me anymore. Hi, I'm back here. Uh, the mouse is what I would, I would use this wired mouse. So yeah, you can use wired mouse on the, on the exam from home. Like you got a laptop, you put a mouse to the side. Absolutely. Now they have a list of all of the things you can do and things you can't do on the CompTIA website. So you can look through that. It tells you, you can have, uh, you can't have headphones. You can have speakers. You can't have uh, a glass that you can't see through, things like this. Or you, maybe you can have a glass with water as long as it's a clear glass. There's things like that that are in the list of things. They keep changing them around. So I may not be speaking what the current set of rules is. Make sure you check the CompTIA website so you really know what the rules are. They have a detailed set so that you understand what the differences are. But yeah, you can use a, a, a wired mouse. They work great. And I highly recommend because that's what I use. Um, other questions. Let's step through some more that you have here. A uh, lot of good stuff you're submitting, by the way. Thank you for putting these questions in. I'm going to see what other questions might be on this list. Um, let's talk. Let's talk big, big uh, security questions. Uh, this is from Nathan who asks, "Why do you think there are so many ransomware events recently?" Well, you're not wrong in thinking and kind of looking at these and seeing these tend to be very cyclical, it seems. Like there seems to be a big group of ransomware events, and then it goes quiet for a while. And another big group of ransomware events, and then it goes quiet for a while. And on top of that, you may notice that a number of these ransomware events are very directed to certain vertical markets. For example, there was a time a year and a half, two years ago, where suddenly tons of hospitals were having significant ransomware events. And before that, there was a series of fast food places that were having a series of ransomware events. Now, along with sort of the random ones that tend to happen all the time and work through those. And whenever you start getting into those types of of situations, it tends to lead you down a road of a couple of different things that are happening. Um, one is that the people that are performing these ransomware events, these are groups of, these are hacker groups. These are well-organized groups of technologists that are working to get the ransomware embedded in these places and cause them to pay this money. And in many cases, it could be tracked back to a specific vulnerability. And we often think of vulnerabilities of things like a Windows vulnerability. For example, there was that, that horrible Windows vulnerability with SMB version 1, that if you have SMB version 1 configured on your Windows device, the hackers can get in exceptionally easy because there's a wide open hole that allows effectively anyone to gain access to any system running SMB version 1, which is why these days SMB version 1 is disabled on all the Windows that we use. And because of that, we tend to think of these vulnerabilities as being very, very global. But in reality, it's not always the case. Take, for example, the vulnerabilities that occurred with the hospitals 
Now, it, although the hospitals don't tell us a lot, we don't learn a lot about the details of how the hackers got in because these are often private organizations that don't have to tell us any details, so they don't. They just talk very broadly about here. We had an incident. This incident caused some outages. All right, that doesn't tell me anything. I'm a technologist. So I want to know what they do. Was it a buffer overflow? Did they take advantage of that a problem? Did they find an issue relating to Windows? Was We want to know. And I'm thinking when they ran through this problem with hospitals, there must have been, in my mind, what I think occurred is that there was a vulnerability associated with hardware or software that was very specific to that market, to the, the healthcare market. So there must have been some technology that healthcare was using that had a wide open problem, and they were able to take advantage of that. And that's why they didn't take over a electrical company. They didn't take over an insurance company. They didn't put ransomware at a manufacturing company because those companies don't have the equipment that a healthcare company might have. And I think that can often be a big reason for that. The other one is that these, um, these organized crime, these organized hacker groups are maybe not, I wouldn't call them organized crime, but certainly an organized hacker group. They are effectively organized crime. Um, they are also ones that they sort of get together, they do this, and then the authorities come after them and they have to disband and go away for a while. And then they regroup as something else. So I think that's another part of the cyclical part of this that we see is these groups that are coming together because it tends to take more than one person. And one of the things we're seeing is that they're getting really smart with this, that they are paying people who work in these companies to install the ransomware on their own systems. This is a documented, well-established thing. They are paying people a lot of money. They're giving, you know, 110, 20 Bitcoins away to someone if they will install this software inside of these companies. So insider threats becomes an enormous problem because the hacker groups are working with people that may be inside of your company that may be a little disgruntled and they wouldn't mind making a little money and they just simply plug in the USB drive and walk away. That's all they had to do to earn that cash. That's a that's a big problem because that's attractive and it's not hard sometimes to find people who are not happy. So that's one of the, the problems you run into as well is that it's more than one thing these days. Uh, they, they tend to get in there. Um, there's, there's some great places to read up on the inside of what's going on. Um, I tend to start on a number of different sites. Uh, the one most recently, um, if you wanted to um, get a good post of, and understand where things are going with technology, there are a lot of great blogs that like from ISC Squared and from the large corporations, they can give you those things. Um, there's a, a, let me find the website um, that I go to. Um, if you wanted to get a breakdown of the uh, of the problems in security and kind of a background on who's doing this, how did this happen? How did this ransomware get into those locations? Um, there's a couple of really great sites to go to. Um, I tend to focus on the folks that are doing the resolution. They're doing the mitigation. That's a great place to go. Uh, but where I tend to get most of my heads up is uh, is Krebs. I go to Krebs on Security, which is uh, KrebsOnSecurity.com, because he does kind of the 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 breakdown of here's what happened, but he also goes into the details of here's what we're hearing on the internet. Here's the group we think was responsible for this. Here's what they were able to do to gain access based on the people that I've talked to, and he kind of breaks down all of the details he has his in fact here's a great article from the 14th of december just a few days ago 10 years later there are new clues in the breach that happened with target 10 years ago that effectively had 40 million credit card numbers available to the world and he goes into more detail here we're continuing to learn information about these where else are you going to learn this stuff so 
he got he has a nice breakdown on all of these. He talks about where this came from. Uh, he got this information from a Russian cybercrime forum, got information from the U.S. Department of Justice. Here is the text string associated with the malware that was also seen at Home Depot. So he starts linking together all of these things. Uh, it's a great site. Krebs on Security is where you want to go. From there, you can bounce out to almost anywhere to find what you're looking for. Just search for what he's talking about. Now you can go to Alf V. Now you can look for Black Cat. Now you can Google all of these different things that you're seeing. Uh, Revil, Black Matter, Dark Side, Colonial Pipeline Attack. It just, it'll take you down the road. You'll get in that, that, uh, that hole and start going down into the details of what was really happening with these. And Krebs on Security is usually where I start when I start going through those. It's a great place to go. So I would I would recommend uh, breaking that down. He's also very good at kind of keeping track or telling you, here's what we're hearing. Here's the group that's doing these right now. Here's what we're hearing in the industry about what's going on with those. A uh, lot to work through, but uh, that's where I go. And a great place to go to get, get a lot of these. Um, other questions, how are we doing on time? We are at the top of the hour, but let's get a couple more questions in. Let's see if we can get these through. Uh, and breaking down the details of this. Um, let's say um, that you've got a number of, let's go through a number of different questions you have here. There's there's a lot of different questions people are having about the exams themselves. Um, so if you break down, in fact, a lot of people, there's a question, a couple of questions that I saw in here that say, I looked in your video course, but I didn't see this information. Now, if you are in a course and you don't find something, it probably is because the thing that you're looking for is not actually in the exam objectives. One of the things I stay very close to in my videos, almost to the letter, are the exam objectives. So, for example, here are the SY0701 exam objectives and all of the different bullets. In fact, you can see some of the annotation I've done. All the different bullets that are here, here for example, in section 1.2, summarize fundamental security concepts. You need to know about CIA. You need to know about AAA. You need to know about non-repudiation. You need to know about gap analysis, zero trust, physical security, and all of the things associated with physical security, and deception and disruption technology. Now, that section is very different than the section that is in the 601 exam. And I think that's what a number of people are running into right now is they're going to 601 books and they're seeing information in the 601 book and they're trying to go to the 701 videos to see where that might be and they're not finding it. And they're saying, wait, these 701 videos aren't complete. When in reality, the 701 videos are sticking to these, these exam objectives to the letter, to the exact letter of what these would be. So I would say if you're trying to find something in the video series, first go to the objectives and find where it is in the objective. That number next to the objective is the number associated with the video that makes it easy to find. And so you'll find exactly what that is. So as I also mentioned, and again, you might want to consider this, as I mentioned, the 601 exam dropped 65% of the objectives. They're gone. We'll never see them in the 701. So if you're going to the 601 materials and you're trying to sync that over to the 701, it can't be done. It's not possible. There's so much that's changed between those two. There are very few lines that you can draw between those two. Most of everything is going to be different. So I wouldn't be surprised that you're not finding something in those two because it's very, very difficult to sync all of that information together. For example, the one here, someone mentioned, I can't find Netcat in your 701 videos. Well, that's because the 701 videos have no command lines in them. All of the command lines were dropped in the 701. They don't exist. They're not in there. So yeah, you're, gonna, you're never going to find Netcat. You won't find uh, CHMOD. You're not going to find anything with, uh, with um, the... The command line utilities with the larger, like the Harvester and uh, the archiving programs that we talked about, all of those things are not in the 701. It's, it's almost a different exam in many ways. There's this tiny sliver of information that is the same, but in the Venn diagram, 
they don't they don't touch very well. I should probably make a Venn diagram that is statistically correct, that visually is really represents it properly, and being able to work through those. Um, they and so the question becomes, and people are asking this rightly in the chat room: Why did they get rid of command lines? Well, that's because CompTIA has the CISA Plus and the CASP certifications. They have two more Security Plus certifications after Security Plus. So when you look into these exams, they needed some way to get you the fundamentals, but then build on those fundamentals, and then finally take it up to the level of somebody who is a security professional. That's effectively now what they've built these three exams to be. Because I think what they were thinking originally, Security Plus is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We need to make sure everybody has access to this information. But then it got too big. And I think they realized at that point, oh, we got to, we either got to make Security Plus two separate exams, which nobody wants. Nobody wants that. Um, even they don't want that. Or we set up Security Plus to be your foundational knowledge of security. And then we build on that functionally in the next one up, SISA Plus. So in SISA Plus, you would need to know how to run InMap, how to run the harvester, what you should expect in the output when you look at InMap, you know, those types of things. Uh, that's your next exam. So I think they were right to pare it down. But in that paring down process, you got to get rid of something. You can't have everything in the exam anymore. It's you got to make a decision about what you want to be in this single exam and make it something that is not overwhelming. I think they did a good job at splitting it up. But now those things are in a different version of an exam. You need to now to go to the CISA Plus to get that hands-on command line thing that many people think about. I, I think many people don't, don't understand the scope of IT security. When you're talking about Windows, there's a very finite set of information you need to know all about the Windows operating system. When you talk about Linux, Linux is a there's, a, there's a very specific set of topics about Linux, and it's very finite. There's a limit to how much you would need to know about that Linux or that you could possibly know about Linux. But when you talk about IT security, the scope is huge. You're talking about all of IT, every operating system, every device, all types of data, the communications protocols, the mechanisms to send that information across the network, the mechanics behind those communications, the cryptography that we use, it's see the scope is enormous when you compare it to the rest of IT. So that's why Security Plus was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think it made sense to focus Security Plus a lot, but they had to get rid of something. And that's what they got rid of. Those things are a little bit different. Uh, you know, once 601 goes away and 701 is what we're left with, it'll just be the normal Security Plus. Nobody will even think of the old version anymore. We're in this weird place right now where both of them exist. So we try to make comparisons, but this is a short-lived comparison. After six months, we won't be making that comparison any longer. Um, and you'll just naturally know, oh, Security Plus is where you start. CISA Plus is where you go from there. CASP is where you end up. I think they're renaming the CASP, right? So they're getting something different there. The Security X, or they're working on something different there. I haven't paid any attention to what, to what they're working with all of those. We'll have to, I, will, I will endeavor to pay more attention in the future, I promise. Uh, other sections, let's keep going through this list. Um, so there's some good ones here that people are rolling through. And I think there, this is a a good sign because many people are in the process of studying and trying to get through these. But what do we do with this? And, and where does it go from here? And that's a, a good question. So the this one is more of a broader question uh, from Jonathan. It says, what degree fields do you recommend for the future? There's so many to choose from, cyber, analytics, information security, information technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you're right. Now, if you're talking specifically degree fields, I would say there's not many to choose from. Um, at least not from the perspective of the state universities. State universities haven't really caught on to information technology quite yet. They're trying in some very limited areas. They are trying to promote themselves as knowledgeable, especially in the cybersecurity side, because that that is something very marketable. And, and uh, um, universities, if nothing else, love things that are marketable. Universities are... are they're effectively a for-profit organization, even a state university tends to be. 
And so they're, they're very careful about what they choose to provide in a, a set of degree fields. And so you won't, it'll be, it's very hard right now to find an information technology degree at a university or a college. It's just hard to find. Um, they tend to focus more on computer science when you get to the university level. And computer science is not the same thing as information technology. Computer science is focused on writing code, building hardware, writing the code to make the hardware work, um, and really working at a more code-based level where you're, you're building applications. That's the world of computer science. The world of information technology doesn't have anything to do with building applications. We don't do programming in information technology. We do scripting, certainly. Uh, we do a lot of automation, absolutely but we don't build applications. We don't write apps. We don't work with C++. We don't write mobile apps. We don't do any of those. So I, I think it's important that people understand getting a computer science degree does not necessarily prepare you for information technology because very little of those two worlds intersect with each other. Very little. The, the problem you run into, though, is that there is an entire world of information technology surrounding operating systems, uh, desktop technologies, mobile technologies, networking, databases, security, data centers, cloud-based technologies, and much more is all around the world of information technology. And it's very hard to find a traditional university that is going to teach you any of those things. Because traditional universities have told us to our face that we are, we are universities. We don't do training. We do education. We are educators. We're not trainers. And so they tend to look at IT as training. And they don't like it. They think that's beneath them. So they simply do not offer it. Uh, and indeed, what you'll find if you look at the information technology uh, careers or, or, or degree fields that are available for those universities, they tend to be a lot of programming classes and an introduction to IT class. And they call that information technology, which doesn't help you either. Now, if, if you've gone through an information technology course and you've not done any networking, you've not worked with any operating systems, you've not configured a database, you've not... Uh, learned how to back these things up. You don't understand anything about the security side of things and how an IPsec tunnel goes together, then you've not really learned anything yet. You're not there. They've not taught you to write things. And so that's the challenge you're going to run into is that a lot of these universities, um, when you talk about degree fields for the future, they're not really working on degree fields for the future. You kind of have to go to the secondary market for this. I, and I'll, I wouldn't say secondary, I'd say alternative market for this. Things like WGU, Western Governors University, is a degree program that focuses on the technology. It's an IT-focused degree program. If you go to many community colleges, um, and I am, a, I am a, a, a graduate of a community college, so I'm, I'm big on community college, they have much more focused technology courses at community colleges than universities will ever have because they're really focused on teaching you things that can help you get a job or get a better job. Generally, community colleges tend to be focused that way. And so that's where you might go to get a CompTIA training, Cisco training, cloud-based training, and good training, people that really know what they're doing. So maybe that's a better place to go than a traditional four-year college. The, it, it really just depends on where you happen to live and what you're trying to do. But I would highly, highly recommend that you very carefully read through the program being offered at that university to really understand if it's very focused on IT or if it isn't focused on IT. And then on top of that, when you're dealing with the university, there will certainly be other classes you are required to take in that information technology program that have nothing to do with information technology. Because for some reason, universities, I know the reason, but they love giving you those courses that have nothing to do with what you're trying to 
teach, to learn yourself, to, to learn about as you're getting this degree. Uh, for example, I got a degree in business. My degree is in business, business management from a four-year degree in Florida, uh, a state university in Florida. And one of the classes I had to take was calculus. How much calculus do we use in business, you may ask? The answer, zero. We do zero calculus in business. Now, there will be some people, I look forward to your cards and letters, that will tell you, no, we use calculus to define this information, the curve, under the curve, the area, so that we can calculate how many boxes go in the back of a truck. There's some type of corner case that they give me. We don't use calculus in business. The computer science people do when they're building our apps that we use on the business side, but we're not talking about computer science. We're talking about a business degree. We don't use calculus in business. We don't. Um, the same thing applies to practically anybody who's taken any degree program at any university. Simply ask anyone who has gotten their degree, hey, did you have to take any classes as part of your major that were required that had nothing to do with your major? 120% of them will tell you, oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to because that's free money for the university. Of course there was. Um, that's the other thing you have to deal with is kind of working through that system and dealing with the ridiculousness sometimes of those. But eventually, getting that four-year degree can be very useful. That's one of the things we just say, all right, all right, we'll, we'll give you this extra money. I'll go take the class, and then I won't have to do anything with it. But you're going to give me that four-year paper, right? Okay, that's the deal. I give you money. I take these classes. You give me the paper, and then I use that to go get a job. And that's a perfectly reasonable transaction if you break it down that way. So uh, find the degree program that makes sense for you. What will be in, right, what I would I recommend for the future? Look at these alternative programs. Don't necessarily limit yourself to a four-year university because many times it will be a less valuable education than had you gone to an alternative source that might prepare you much better for a career in information technology. And there's plenty to learn there from an information technology perspective. Um, don't, don't limit yourself. Always go down the road of figuring out where the best place will be for what you need to learn. And I've tried many different, I have had, uh, I have three kids. All of them have gone through IT type training classes, one at a traditional university, which actually had an IT program. And it wasn't bad. It was actually pretty good. It wasn't horrible. But it was, it was so, uh, the, the university didn't know what to do with it to the point they got rid of the entire program. That's, that's what we're struggling with today. Is here's a, Here was a four-year, this was a private college, but it was a four-year college that, um, that my wife is a, that Mrs. Professor Messer is an alumni of this four-year college that our, our first kid went to that program that program doesn't even exist anymore. But the, but she did get her IT degree. It's an information technology degree. So she got that, and she does work here at Messer Studios. My middle kid went to a different university in Florida that focuses on technology and got a degree in cloud computing. He's brilliant. He knows everything there is to know about those cloud computing things. So he did that. And I have another kid right now who is taking classes at WGU. And learning, he's got his A+. Plus. He's working on his network place. He just got started. So he's going down the road of learning all of those certifications. I love it. I think that's great. So you may be able to find similar things, some at a four-year university, some at an alternative school, some at WGU. Just depends on what you're trying to do. Everyone is a little bit different. Uh, but spend the time reading through the detailed classes that are expected for this particular program, that's going to be the important part because now you can start comparing and contrasting against all of these other places. Find the one that makes sense. I think that would be good. Now, would a, I've spoken about two-year degrees and four-year degrees already. You know, any formal education is good. I have a, a, a video, it's in the YouTube video description of this video, which is how to get a job in IT with no experience. And one of the things I mentioned is you really need four elements um, at a, at a, to make it its best possible 
chance of getting a job, um, the first element is to get a formal education. Having a four-year degree or a two-year degree is valuable and it can be used on your resume to work towards getting that job. Employers still like two-year degrees and they still like four-year degrees. And so you need to have a two or four-year degree, ideally a four-year degree to be able to do that and have your best chance at getting that job. The other is getting some practical experience. Uh, there's another one where uh, we talk about getting some uh, industry certifications. So even though you got that four-year degree, it still would be nice if you had an A-plus network plus and security plus. It would. And then lastly, may not even be expecting this, the fourth element when you're trying to get that first job in IT is you know someone who already works there. People like hiring people they know and people they can trust. So creating a or building a series of relationships in uh, the technology industry is important. If you already have your, um, if you've worked hard at building out your LinkedIn, you've got a nice jumping off point there. If you attend your local Cisco user group meetings, Microsoft user group meetings, Palo Alto Networks user group meetings, whatever you can find, go to those user group meetings. Even if you're in college, go to those user group meetings. The people at the meetings are people that work in IT for the companies that you're trying to get a job at. What a great place to meet people so that when you put in your resume, in fact, these user group meetings are great places to give someone your resume um, because usually these big companies have programs where they will give employees a bonus if they bring in somebody that is hired which encourages the employees to ask people for their resume. You might even not even ask to give your resume. You may be talking to somebody, oh, you work in that big company that, that he is here in town. That's great. What do you do there? Oh, that's fantastic. I'm working currently on getting my degree in that. I should be done over the summer. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, maybe I'll put an a, a application in when we're done with that. And they will almost always say, you should send your resume to me right now. Because then they can put their your name in with HR and they get locked in. If they hire you, they get cash. That's a win-win. So use those relationships. And that way, when you walk in the re into the, uh, the meeting where it's now your interview, um, hey, we saw your resume. We'd like to bring you in. Let's talk about the things you've done. Let's talk about your degree. Um, how did how'd you come to, to put your resume in with us? Oh, I know George from the Microsoft user group meeting. We had a great conversation about the systems that you have here. He was working on a big backup project where he was going to make sure that all of the systems were backed up every night and you could recover everything within an hour. There was an interesting technology he was using with that. Here's what they did. So you can even talk to these things, but that's your way in. Um, there's, there's value there. So not only is a degree useful, not only is practical experience useful and industry certifications are useful, knowing people is very useful. And it will continue to be for your entire career, by the way. That LinkedIn becomes a very important asset for your career. You should continue to use that, be able to take advantage. I don't want to say it that way, like take advantage of the people you know. But we we have this tight-knit group of people that we've worked with, that people we know, and people who know people we know. It's nice to be able to lean on those folks when you need a job or you're looking for a position and we're very good in this industry about pointing people different places. And, oh, I heard about a job over there. Did you talk to them? Here's somebody else. I just heard of a position opened up. You should go talk to those folks. So that is that is a very, very good idea about those and working through them. And something you should consider if you're planning to work towards a position either now or in the future, which is pretty much all of us at this point, I would think. Uh, other question. Uh, we'll do one last sort of um one, one question about logistics, and then I think we're sort of getting well past the top of the hour here. We'll get this one in here. Tyler asks, hey, do vouchers expire? Can I buy one now and use it in five months? And uh, the answer is maybe. Depends. Uh, vouchers do expire first. We'll answer that question. The answer is yes, vouchers expire. The vouchers that you get from my website or you buy directly from CompTIA will be valid for one year approximately one year, minus one or two days, depending on when you purchase them. So it's effectively good for a year. And those are something where if you bought it today, you could use it 
all the way up to a year from now. Now, important consideration with that is that the vouchers must be used and you must take your exam before that expiration date. Ah, so you can't buy it today, wait a year from now, schedule your exam, and take the exam in January. Can't do that because now you've gone over that year. You have to take the exam before the expiration date of the voucher. So I often tell people, um, when you're ready to take the exam, buy your voucher then. There's no reason to buy the voucher now if you're going to take the exam five months from now. There are some websites that sell vouchers out there that will sell a voucher that only has a small window of availability. So they might sell you a voucher that's good for 30 days, that's good for 90 days, that's good for six months. So the, the exact expiration is different depending on where you buy the voucher from and how you're purchasing it. So make sure you check whatever site you're going to and make sure that you're getting it for the full year. Or just go to professormesser.com slash vouchers, and then you know it's good for a year every time. Uh, but that's an important thing. I've had people buy vouchers from my site, and then they send me a note a year later saying, oh, I forgot to use this. Is there anything I can do? It's been a year. It expired. It's no good anymore. There's not, And the voucher is nothing I can do. It's not my voucher. It's CompTIA's voucher. I'm simply reselling it on their behalf. So I tell people all the time, go talk to CompTIA. Give them a, sa a sob story. Tell them about, you know, the you've got a, a, a family at home. You've got 10 kids at home that are sick. You've been taking care of them. Um, you're living day to day, and you just need to take the exam next week and see if they'll give you an extension to a week. Do something. That doesn't guarantee they're going to do that, but... That's the only place you can go at that point because they're the only ones who can control what happens with the vouchers. I have no visibility into the voucher system. I have no control over the voucher system. I have they, I don't want any control. <laughs> in, case, in case anybody from CompTIA is watching, I do not want any control over the voucher system. I do not want any visibility into the voucher system. Um, but that's their, that's their configuration. They're the ones that manage that process. I don't have any visibility or control into any of that. I can get you a voucher for a good price. And at that point, my access to the system is limited. So um, it's it's um, it's an important thing that you now you have to take uh, control of. You're the one who's in charge of those vouchers and the expiration dates. So make sure that you use the right vouchers, the right expiration dates, and that you don't miss anything because I would hate it if you bought that voucher and then you showed up a year from now saying, oh, this expired. Is there anything I can do? Oh. Sometimes, sometimes there are, are things I can do. I can at least send an email to somebody and go, what do you think? Is there anything we can do back at CompTIA? But I have limited pull. There's, I, there's not a lot of juice there that I can pull from this. They don't, even, they don't listen to me like, oh, well, sure, we'll get you one. They don't, no. They take it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it just depends on how things are going at that point. I'll, I'll, but all I can do is ask. I don't mind asking, but generally... There's not much that can happen at that point. And being able to make those things really, uh, really work. Once, the, once it expires, it's very little we can do. Um, so don't let it expire. And make sure the vouchers that you purchase are good for one year. I think you'll be fine. There's not going to be an issue with that. Don't, uh, don't, don't do that. Don't limit. Uh, have those limits and work through those. Be, be a bad situation. Um, so I think if you're someone who is trying to, to really focus on security, um, this is your goal. And since we've been talking about security plus this whole time, uh, David's, David asks, what would be your advice to take after passing the security plus for a career in cybersecurity? Now, as I've already mentioned a number of times in this study group, the cybersecurity market is not generally an entry level position. Don't, there's not a lot of entry level positions in IT security relative to the rest of IT. Some people try to stop my statement right there saying there's very few entry level jobs in IT security, which is not necessarily true because there's a lot of jobs in IT security. There's just a lot more in the rest of IT that are entry level. It's much easier to get an entry level position doing something else in IT than in security. 
because as I mentioned, security does not tend to be um, a line of work that promotes entry level work. Generally, you work into IT security. After you've learned everything you can learn about workstation security and workstation management, then you've moved up into server administration, either Windows or Linux. You've now moved into networking. You can manage and configure and design switch networks, routed networks. You've connected together maybe VPN connectivity before. You've configured authentication systems. You have built out redundant networking components from the firewall level to the core router level to your core switches. You've built out cloud-based technologies. Now, finally, you're ready to dive into security. <laughs> so yeah, that whole thing that I sort of spelled out for you was sort of a five to seven year journey to get you from knowing nothing to knowing enough that you can now secure all of those technologies. So that's their focus. That's what I try to tell people is um, there is a market for IT security. It's not necessarily an entry-level market. There are some entry-level positions in security. But you may find for your strategy, it might make more sense to start with server administration, start with a help desk position, start with a field service technician, and build on that knowledge to learn all of those other pieces that will finally position you to get an entry-level position into security. Entry-level in security means you already have a wealth of knowledge in IT, a little bit different than entry-level into IT itself. So I would recommend if you're someone who has got Security Plus and you're thinking, I'd love to do security someday, I would recommend you now start learning everything you can about Windows, everything you can about Linux, everything you can about the network, and then layer on top of that all of those services running over the network, cloud-based services, web services, databases, encrypted tunnels, and all of those other pieces that we use every day. Once you do that, you will be ready to step into a role that is associated with security. So it's not a direct jump from, I got my degree, now, where's my cybersecurity job? It's usually, I got my degree. Let's do a lot of work on the desktop. Let's work with servers. Let's work with networks. Let's now finally get to a point where we can be uh, knowledgeable enough to get a role in security. And I think that's where a lot of the industry doesn't do a very good job at preparing people for that. I think it sees um, cybersecurity as an opportunity to train people and give them a degree but they sort of skip the part that, yeah, now that you have this, you got to go back and learn everything else now. And that's maybe a little off-putting when you get to that point realizing, wait, I, I got a degree. I have a, I have a master's degree in cybersecurity from a, a four-year institution. Well, that's great. But now you need to learn operating systems. And now you need to learn networks because you have to secure those. And how are you going to secure those if you know nothing about them? And that is the real key behind security. Um, you will find that there are different paths, though. Everybody has a different path to get to where they want to be. This is not on a rail. No, There's not a set of check marks, and you follow those check marks, and you end up at the end of the rainbow. Everybody's got a different way of getting there. Some of us go through server administration and networking. Some people find their first job in a security operations center. Somebody start, some people start working for a manufacturer. They, their first job is working for a manufacturer or that are, they're building firewalls or they're building other technologies and putting it into people's networks and they're securing it. Maybe you find yourself doing work for a company that implements wireless networks, tons of security there. So just the process of doing your day-to-day -day also builds on a layer of security on top of that. So it's going to be different for everyone. It's going to be fun regardless of what the path happens to be. But you're the one that needs to figure out the path. You know where you want to go, but you need to put all of those steps that you're going to follow along the way in that path. And that might be in your particular market. Maybe you're in an enormous area. Maybe you live in New York City where every IT job there is is in that town. And that means that it might be very easy to build a pathway between point A and point B and a minimum number of steps. 
Or you might find that you live in a part of uh, of the world where there are very few technology companies or very few technology jobs available in your area. And you may find that there are limited options. Maybe you have to start working at field service technician so that you can then get a job working in an IT help desk group so that you can then jump into the server administration. So it's a little bit different depending on where you might be. And if you work for the federal government, it's a different path than if you work for a non-governmental agency in a commercial market. Maybe it's different if you work for a nonprofit. Oh, it's very different if you work for a nonprofit. If you work for a manufacturing company, it's going to be very different than if you work for a financial company. A difference in the type of technology that you use, a difference in how much money the company has. There's many differences. So effectively, you could be a network administrator and that single network administrator job is very different depending on the company you go to. It happens all the time. And I've been to hundreds, maybe even thousands of different companies and talked to different network and security administrators at every single one of them. Their jobs are all very similar, but where they do these jobs and how these jobs are structured can be very, very different between all of them. You're the one that has to build the path. So you need to take charge of your own career. These things don't happen on their own. If you want to get into that job, you have to make it happen. And that's why I tell you to set up your LinkedIn, post to your LinkedIn page, find a good group of people and a good set of, of user groups to attend, meet the people in your area, and now start putting together the strategy that is going to take you from where you are to ultimately where you would like to be. I think that's going to be the first big step. And what you may find is you get halfway down this road and suddenly it takes you a different direction you weren't expecting. That's also very normal. Technology moves very, very fast. You can think about where you would like to be in five years. The problem is the world changes under our feet constantly in security. And we may find a whole different group of technologies that very appeals, appeals to us very much. We may want to change our strategy as we move along here. So I often tell you it's it's this you're riding the waves of this river and the river sort of taking you along. But occasionally the river cuts a new path or the river has a fork that goes in another direction. And you may end up taking that fork. You may go to that different path and you may find that that path happens to have a lot of advantages you weren't even planning on when you started going down that road. That's what technology is about. That's why I love it. That's why I'm here doing what I do so that I can tell you some of the great things that might be available for you once you get to that point. It's uh, the world's your oyster. You just have to figure out what makes sense for you, what are the things that are most important for you and your family, and then you go after those. Well, I think that's a good place to stop for 2023. This is our last live event of the year. You have made it an amazing 2023. I want to thank every single one of you that's watching live. Thank you if you're watching this on the replay. We could not thank you enough for the support that you've shown us over this last year. It has been incredible. And we are looking forward to an amazing 2024. We've got a lot of things planned. We've got a lot of technologies and training that we're planning to do. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we hope that you're here with us to enjoy it every step of the way. We hope all of you have a fantastic holiday season. Have a great new year. We look forward to seeing you in January for our next live event and throughout the rest of 2024. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group.